Checking one more time. This is Brianne here. I'm wondering if I can practice sharing my screen for a minute and a half. Yes, you can. Go ahead. Okay. How does that look? <laughs> Hey, Aaron is the first one running. You know, this is just like what we do. Yeah. Look good? Yep. Thanks. Good morning. It is 9.30 on Tuesday, October 3rd, and I'm going to call to order this meeting of the Board of Supervisors. Uh, let's begin with a roll call, Rhonda. Supervisor Arenas. Here. Supervisor Chavez. Here. Supervisor Sumidian. Here. Vice President Lee. Good morning, President. <laughs> President Ellenberg. I am here as well. We have a quorum. Thank you. Uh, Supervisor Sumidian, would you do us the honor of leading the Pledge of Allegiance? I 
pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. In what may be a first, a former member of our Board of Supervisors will pr be presenting today's invocation. Uh, Supervisor Ken Yeager ably served District 4 from 2006 to 2018 after completing terms on the San Jose City Council and the San Jose Evergreen Community College District Board of Trustees. Ken was the first openly gay elected official in Santa Clara County and it is in celebration of October as coming out month that I asked him to inspire us this morning. Ken spearheaded the creation of both the nation's first County Office of LGBTQ Affairs and our county's gender affirming care clinic. He has been a staunch advocate of LGBTQ plus candidates for political office and has served in a variety of capacities on numerous committees, boards, organizations, and universities. Ken earned a BA in political science from San Jose State and an MA in sociology and PhD in education from Stanford. He is a fitness enthusiast, the author of two books, neither of which he will promote this morning, and bears primary responsibility for the lack of cake served at county facilities. My supervisor, Ken Yeager. Thank you, President Ellenberg. Uh, it is good to be here at the start of LGBTQ History Month and also to celebrate National Coming Out Day on October 11th. Both of these occasions have great meaning to me. I remember my own coming out in 1984 with an opinion piece in the San Jose Mercury News, which changed the whole trajectory of my life for the better. A little history. In uh, 1979, one of the most memorable events in this chamber occurred when a 6.0 earthquake struck as the Board of Supervisors debated passing an ordinance barring discrimination based on sexual orientation. The hundreds of evangelical Christians in attendance saw it as a sign of God uh, for the Board not to pass the ordinance, which they bravely did despite that. Unfortunately, in a campaign as ugly as anything happening in Florida today against the queer community, a referendum to overturn the ordinance won by 70% of the vote, ending the nascent gay movement in Silicon Valley for many years. But over time, our community fought back and was stronger for it. For example, in 1986, we had only one elected official attend the Baymec dinner. But at the Baymec brunch this year, we had over 500 people and 100 elected officials and candidates attending. Setbacks and gains. It was in January 1986 that I stood at this very spot and urged the board to allocate the first dollars to combat HIV AIDS in this county. Volunteer organizations could no longer handle the growing number of people who needed social services and housing. Not only was the funding granted, but Supervisor Suzanne Wilson moved to create a countywide HIV AIDS task force and appointed me as chair. Our current HIV AIDS programs and services have their roots in those actions. I am particularly proud of our getting to zero program and our goal of zero infections, zero deaths, and zero stigma. Setback and gains. On March 7, 2000, California voters enshrined marriage as between a man and a woman. Wisely, the California Supreme Court overturned Prop 22, and on June 17, 2008, same-sex couples got married in California. County Executive Jeff Smith and Clerk Recorder Gina Alcamendez made sure we were ready for the long line of same-sex couples ready to be married. As a supervisor, I was, by a quirky law, able to conduct marriages, so I had the honor of marrying our county's first same-sex same couples uh, in the 10th floor conference room with a room full of media and supporters. A setback occurred months later when Prop 8 passed, but we won the right again with the U.S. Supreme Court ruling in 2013. The lines were even longer, and I married 26 couples that day setbacks and gains. One more quick memory. 
It was June 5th, uh, 2007, when my colleagues and I raised the rainbow flag at the county for the very first time. Over time, flying the flag extended to an entire month, then to every workday of the year. Later, it was joined by the transgender pride flag, and now the progress pride flag is flown. Every time the LGBTQ community experiences a setback, we come back stronger, joining allies with the promise that an attack on one of us is a, an attack on all of us. That is especially important now as we fight far-right extremists demonizing members of our transgender community and stigmatizing anyone who supports them. We have been here before, and we are fighting back. In Los Gatos, when the haters threatened violence over a rainbow crosswalk in front of City Hall, we fought back with a massive United Against Hate march and rally. When protesters wanted to stop a recent drag queen story hour at the Books Inc. in Campbell, our community came out in force and the kids got to hear wonderful age appropriate stories. And when a member of the Franklin McKinley School Board misrepresented the content of the district's curriculum, other board members voted to censor him. We must remain vigilant in our opposition to the informed parents of Silicon Valley and the Values Advocacy Council. We, make, we must make sure they do not get traction in 2013 like similar groups did in 1980. Thank you again, President Ellenberg, for asking me to speak, and thank you for your referral on the status of our county's medical and mental health programs for our transgender community. We cannot accept setbacks, only gains. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ken, not only for, for sharing your personal, uh, a bit of your personal story here, but reminding us of how long this county has been uh, a strong supporter of LGBTQ rights, and I have no doubt will continue to be, um, perhaps even long after any of the five of us are here. Thank you. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, we are moving on to adjournments. Sorry, let me pull up my... Our first adjournment uh, will be offered in memory of Randy Schreifer by uh, Supervisor Arenas. Thank you, President Ellenberg. Uh, it is a deep sorrow that we adjourn today in honor and memory of Captain Randy Schreifer, a devoted husband, father, and friend and we are joined today by his wife, Kelly uh, Schrieffer and Captain Brian Matchett. Um, I also have noted that we have a, a full house of San Jose um, folks and some actually, um, my, my heart is warmed by that. Um, we also have Christina Naya, Dave and Naya, John Anderson, um, Jennifer Anderson, who are colleagues and friends and of course, uh, under leadership, we have our Chief Mata and Captain Jimenez, as well as Officer Steve Aponte. So thank you so much, everyone, for, for being here. Um, I know you all know this already, um, that Randy was really dedicated to his career in public service and protecting the safety and well-being of all of us, families, women, children in San Jose. And he did this for more than 23 years. Um, before he actually retired as a captain last year. And I actually had the pleasure of working with Captain Schriefer in um, my former capacity as a council member for District 8. Um, I represented an area, a uh, portion of the east side as well as Evergreen area. And um, uh, during that time, we didn't have a burglary unit. And so it was very challenging because, um, of course, uh, there are certain parts of, of San Jose that get hit a little um, harder than the rest because they're away from the city center. Um, it takes a little bit longer for, for calls to get responded to. Um, and folks take advantage of this, of course. Um, and um, it was at one of those community meetings where there's a lot of um, anger and shouting and um, frustration on behalf of our community members that I really got to see what Randy was made of. And um, you know, his presence alone is just uh, a fortitude 
and um, and provides a level of safety for everybody. He um, assured our, our community members, and I was absolutely grateful because this is actually my neighborhood. And so these were my neighbors um, who were just up in arms. Um, and I, of course, had to go home to, to that very neighborhood. And so it made a huge difference when, when Captain Schriefer stood really strong with me and listened and was absolutely charismatic, as you all know him to be, um, injecting humor um, into his comments and really creating a level of, of safety for our neighborhood in which um, it really transformed our conversations. People were ready to you know, take up arms and defend their property. Um, and at the end of that meeting, what we had was people who were willing to um, collaborate and partner with us and listen um, and actually advocate for a burglary unit. Not, not too long after that, we actually reestablished the burglary unit. Um, and so I'm, I'm actually very grateful to have known uh, Randy. This wasn't the only um, experience. You know, he, he also helped us clean up blight um, uh, and clean up some storefronts after one of those store owners um, was uh, killed um, in, a, in a burglary. Um, and, uh, you know, his charm once again, um, helped us bring people together in a way that makes a difference for our neighborhoods. And it leaves a lasting impression um, in the level of safety that we all feel. Because um, he represented the law, right? He represented order and he represent, represented um, hope that is the last really um, to extinguish for all of us. Um, the other area of work that I wanted to make sure that I mentioned was um, this was a sexual assault um, prevention education that I had um, requested um, funding for for middle school and high school students. And this was before actually um, Supervisor Chavez, you and I started working on the sexual assault, um, uh, the gender-based violence prevention uh, work that we um, did uh, across um, our entities. And, and what we were doing was really just trying to do our, our own work in terms of um, encouraging and supporting survivors in, in um, junior high and high school. Um, and, uh, and Captain Schriefer helped lead with those efforts and I'm, I'm absolutely um, grateful for that. Um, we, we later, of course, folded all that in into a huge gender-based violence work plan that's left there that is part of his legacy um, and that um, you and your uh, girls should be very, very proud of. Um, so I, I, could, I could go on, um, but I'm, I'm not going to because I know that you know him better than me. I just wanted to share with you some of um, the ways that he impacted my community, my life, um, and our our neighbors. Um, and so I'm just absolutely grateful um, that we were able to cross paths. Um, I'm extremely lucky uh, to have known um, Randy. Um, truly blessed. I know that he is he's a resident of Morgan Hill, and like many of our San Jose PD, um, who are also part of South County, I know that they're, this is a great loss to that community. And so, and it hits home as I've shared, you know, my sister is also a um, investigator in the sexual assault unit in, in Oakland. And so I, I'm, my heart is, is heavy for you and I'm sorry for your loss. Um, I know he gave so much to all of us in his profession and as a person, and so I'm absolutely honored um, to be able to adjourn tonight, today's meeting um, in his name. So may he rest in peace and his commitment to serve our community be honored 
in how we show up to serve our county. So thank you so much. And I, if if um, you are okay, uh, Captain Matchett, uh, and who, you're a colleague and friend, if you would like to share a few words, if you would go to the podium. time for this uh, adjournment and Supervisor Arenas, uh, thank you for your kind and beautiful words. Um, I could stand up here and echo the same sentiments that, that came from you uh, about my dear friend and, and colleague. Um, he impacted many uh, at the San Jose Police Department and in the greater San Jose community um, for the time he had with us his great deal of charm and big personality. Uh, he impacted the community, and we know that because we received no less than a thousand text messages, emails, and letters from the community about the service uh, he provided. Um, he is somebody that I model myself after, that many model themselves after, and he is the kind of police officer we like to see and we wish we saw more of. Uh, he will be truly missed by everyone, especially friends, colleagues, family, uh, but he will certainly be missed by the community at large. I really thank you for this time. Thank you, and with my condolences as well, Supervisor Chavez would like to add a few final words. Thank you, um, and I, I wanted to say a special thank you to Supervisor Arenas for um, allowing us this opportunity to honor um, your husband. And you know, just a couple of things that I wanted to add. I think, you know, one is that whenever um, systems of government try to work together, it's always, always, almost always messy, painful, and incredibly uncomfortable. And in areas that it really mattered, I just wanted to say that, you know, your husband leaned in on the Child Advocacy Center and making sure that we could protect children, the most vulnerable kids in our community. And I'm so grateful to the San Jose Police Department, but in particular um, for everybody who worked to make that happen. And Randy was one of those people. And I, I think for a lot of us, especially as we think about crimes of, um, you know, of uh, violence, sexual violence in particular, that having leaders in the community that really understand that problem and are willing to lean in when it's really difficult to do that is just so appreciated. So uh, to all of you, thank you for the leadership that you've played in our partnership, and in particular, Kelly, to you and to your daughters um, for, frankly, letting us share uh, Randy and what a special, vibrant, <laughs> engaging, somewhat, I, I would say, mercurial person and how much we um, benefited as a community from, from him. And Brian, I really appreciate you saying how many people reached out because it's just an indication of how important um, he was to the community and how important the community was to him. Thank you for letting us honor him this way. Thank you. Our uh, second adjournment will be offered today by Supervisor Lee in memory of Reverend Benito O. Manding. Thank you, President Allenberg. Um, Father Ben Mundig was born in Baclayan, Bohol, in Philippines, to Cristoro and Anunciacion Mandig. He was the first and only son born and grew up with nine younger sisters. His father happened to be the town mayor. All of his nine siblings, three of his sisters, would then enter a religious life. Father Ben had once aspired to be a medical doctor, but God would call him to be a doctor of souls, following his uncle, Father Gabriel Opus' footsteps. Father Ben was ordained to priesthood on December 20th, 1964, for a diocese of Tagbiglalian in Bajo, Philippines. He then served as chaplain, lecturer at the La Salle University in Manila, and earned his doctorate in sacred theology at the University of Santos Tomas. Soon after, he was sent to New York by Bishop Macarenas. Uh, to serve on the faculty and as chaplain at Christian Brothers Academy in New York. During this time, he would receive his Doctor of Philosophy at Syracuse University. He returned to the Philippines in 1977, served as Chancellor and Secretary to the Bishop of 
to Lauren and until he immigrated to the U.S., taking residence within the joining Diocese of San Jose as he serves the campus minister in San Francisco State University and also City College. Father Ben served as a pecoral vicar at St. Martin Church in Sunnyvale from 84 to 87 and St. Joseph Church in Mount View in 89 to 90. Also served as faculty in St. Joseph College Seminary in Los Altos. He would later become the first incarnated Filipino priest in the Diocese of San Jose, founding director of Diocesan Filipino Council and installed as a pastor of St. Martin Church from 1990 to 2008. He remained active in his priestly vocation throughout his retirement years, including the last three plus years with his nightly online prayer Bible study group. Father Ben was called home to the Lord on August 1st, 2023, at the age of 85 years old. He is predeceased by his parents and his two sisters, survived by seven sisters, and many, many grand nieces and grand nephews. This is tremendous loss to our Sunnyvale community, and Father Ben, May you rest in peace for dedicating six decades of your life to God to serve his people. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Thank you. Lee. Uh, we have some commendations to present this morning, and it's my honor to offer the first uh, for John Washington. So, uh, John, come on up and join me. Bless well. Save a life. And that means, I think on, on such a deep level, that really is true. If, if the value of every individual is infinite, saving one life is equivalent to saving the world. On August 25th, 2023, while on duty at 1919 Center Road, Protective Services Officer John Washington quickly identified a life-threatening situation when a client collapsed and showed no pulse. Without hesitation, he called 911 and began to administer CPR. He then applied an, an automated external defibrillator, an AED device, which proved to be the critical action that restored the client's heartbeat. Thanks to John's courageous, timely, and appropriate response, EMS personnel were able to stabilize the patient and transfer them to the hospital. John's calm and controlled actions, as well as his immediate and capable management of the, of the incident, are exemplary characteristics and reflect our ideal of selflessness, service, and duty to the county's residents. John Washington is a hero and an inspiration to us all. Today, I am proud to present him with a commendation signed by myself and my colleagues on the Board of Supervisors. We're going to take a photo with John. We'll turn our backs on you for just a moment. We have two additional presentations this morning, uh, both from Supervisor Chavez, uh, first for Proclamation of Digital Inclusion Month, and second for Trigeminal Neuralgia Awareness Day. 
Thank you very much, President Ellenberg. And today, I'm just I'm going to invite up our whole team. And um, today, we I am really honored to proclaim October 2023 as Digital Inclusion Month in Santa Clara County. And this is an initiative that aims to bridge the digital divide and ensure equitable access to digital resources for all of our residents. You know, many of us really um, saw that we, we had a problem with digital inclusion before COVID, but when COVID hit, we really saw it. We saw that there were children who weren't able to do homework, that when people needed telemedicine, they weren't able to access it, that many, many households in our communities didn't even have enough um, uh, service to their homes to have more than one device working at a time. And so we know that the digital divide is not just about technology, it's really about, it's as basic as every other utility, water, electricity, garbage collection. It's a core component of how people in our community um, can survive. And also it's how people get jobs, get healthcare, um, get to move on to their next opportunity. There is literally no aspect of our modern life that doesn't rely on internet services. So here we've been fighting to close that digital divide and I, and I have to say um, how excited I am that we have such amazing partners. The mission of the Digital Inclusion Month is inspired by challenges facing individuals who are really disenfranchised. And as a community, we should strive to educate our residents about the importance of digital inclusion and by doing so set high standards for not just public health, safety, and economic opportunity in Santa Clara County, but across the country. So with that, I'm, you know, we have the dynamic duo here of Nina uh, Diamato and Jill uh, Bourne, and I'm gonna let them, they're both pointing who's gonna speak first, but I'm gonna let them choose. Welcome. Let's give them a round of applause for their good words. Well, we're really excited, and as the supervisor noted, it is the 21st century utility. So uh, connection to the internet is paramount for all our residents. And here is a person that puts a lot of effort into it, the city librarian. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, Nina. Um, thank you, Supervisor Chavez and the Board of Supervisors. Uh, I am Jill Bourne. I am the city librarian in San Jose, which means I have the great privilege of being library director for the San Jose Public Library System. Um, we all deeply understand why closing the digital divide is so critical for our learning, connectedness with each other, for telehealth, and also access to the global economy. So in 2017, the city of San Jose noted that 90,000 people in our city did not have access to the internet. This became an urgent focus for leaders at the city and county. Um, many partners, we worked together also with partners in the community and our staff. Today, we understand that that number has been reduced to about 41,000. There's still so much to do, but we're, we're happy to see that number going down and there's a lot to celebrate. So nationwide, this week is recognized as Digital Inclusion Week, but in Silicon Valley, of course, we have so much going on that we could not fit it into a single week. So uh, we are counting it as Digital Inclusion Month, and we're taking over a whole month. So in honor of all the work that's been done, the partnerships we've formed, and the progress that we've made in closing the digital divide in Silicon Valley, but also recognizing how much more there is to do, I'm really happy to be here and thankful for the opportunity to proclaim October as Digital Inclusion Month. Um, I wanna th th say some thanks to a community planning committee made up of nonprofit partners and our internet service providers. We are excited to announce that there are more than 50 events happening this month at libraries and community-based organizations around the county. All of these events are aimed at getting people connected to the internet and supporting skill development so that they can use technology tools effectively and safely. Um, you can learn more about it at our library's website, www.sjpl.org, or just searching for Digital Inclusion Month. And I wanna thanks again to the county for your ongoing commitment and investment in this work, and I hope you'll all joining us in recognizing this month. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you so much. I want to introduce our amazing team. Um, Anne Grabowski is our digital equity manager for the 
San Jose Public Library, but also for the city of San Jose, uh, Yadira Orozco Lemos. Did I say it right? Yes. Oh my gosh. <laughs> She's our brand new manager for um, the digital skills building work that we're doing. And then Abby Schul is, um, she, she oversees all of the um, relationships with our telecommunications providers, and which is so important in this work. So they make up our digital equity team working with the county. Thank you again. Thank well you. done. Yeah, no, I, I so. We're going to present this commendation to you, but can I ask my colleagues to come down for a photo? Mm -hmm. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you for the good work. So and I'm going to put you and Nina in the middle. Nina. Thank you so much. Amazing. Thank you. All right, let's give them another round of applause. They are really doing amazing work. I mean, really getting 45,000 people or more connected to the internet and having access is impressive. Um, today, um, I'm also getting the opportunity to present a proclamation to recognize October 7th as tri Trijamunal Neurology Awareness Day in Santa Clara County. And I'm going to ask, um, where did Sean go? Oh, Sean, can you come down? And Sean's going to uh, receive this. Um, and let me just say, this is a condition that affects the nerves causing severe facial pain. The pain can be felt in various parts of the face, including the lips, eyes, nose, scalp, and jaw. You can come up right here. Um, and although this is a relatively rare, affecting 4.3 people per 100,000 annually, its impact on those who suffer from it is really significant. The pain can be debilitating, affecting daily activities and mental well-being. October 7th is a day when sufferers of TN, their friends and family, come together to raise awareness about the condition, and very few people know about it, truly. They educate the public about symptoms and challenges with TN, and even offer educational materials to healthcare professionals who may not be familiar enough with the condition even to diagnose it, and that's a huge problem. TN Awareness Day campaigns encourages various activities to raise awareness, such as wearing teal or lighting up local buildings and monuments in teal. And these activities aim to create more compassionate community that understands the struggles faced by those who, who suffer from TN. On behalf of the Board of Supervisors, we are honored to present you with this proclamation. And I also just want to say thank you so much, Sean, because when Sean saw that there was a day, she sent me a note saying, we've got to start doing something about it here in Santa Clara County, and you're absolutely right. And this is um, acknowledging the challenges faced by those who are suffering from this condition and really to promote not just public awareness, but deep public understanding. So we're going to give you a round of applause, let you say a few words. Um, it's no surprise to those who know me, I've never been normal. As a baby, I never took steps, I just walked across the room one day. I never said a word until an entire sentence and it contained an obscenity. Some things never change. <laughs> so it almost made sense that I managed to suddenly get something that only 4.3 per 100,000 people per year are diagnosed with. And I was diagnosed much younger than most people are, which is over 50 if you're wondering. Like most people with trigeminal neuralgia, I'm female and I have it on the right side. That means the trigeminal nerve that carries sensations from your face to your brain and goes along my eye, cheek, and jaw is only affected on the right side of my face. The other side of my face is perfectly fine. This makes you feel completely insane that one side of your face could be going through so much intense pain and tumult while the other side is having a great day. There's no known cause, but there are theories, and a variety of triggers may set off trigeminal neuralgia pain like they do for me, including sunlight, strobe effects, strong smells, perfumes, cologne, touching your face, eating, drinking, brushing your teeth, 
talking, shaving, just seeing if you're paying attention. That one was for men who often grow beards to avoid touching parts of their face. Putting on makeup, breeze, light blowing over your face, small washing, smiling, washing your face, crying. Crying is a tough one. The best way I can describe the pain is for, from trigeminal neuralgia for me is constantly and randomly getting stabbed in your eye, cheek, and jaw with an ice pick. It would hurt, right? You'd want to cry. But crying just creates more pain, so you learn to stop yourself from crying. These are two examples of the kind of situations trigeminal neuralgia sufferers like me endure and why trigeminal neuralgia is commonly known as the suicide disease. Between 25 to 50% of people with trigeminal neuralgia commit suicide within two years. A few years ago, I had brain surgery in an effort to better address the pain. Out of 17 million Kaiser patients in California, I am one of four to have this specific brain implant and the only one who isn't bedridden. Is this a good time to mention I support all the Kaiser workers about to strike tomorrow? I never would have had brain surgery if a close friend hadn't given me great advice. She told me not to be funny. I had, brain, I had been experiencing my symptoms and how painful it was, but been being told there was nothing they could do. When I went in, raw with emotion, unmasked by wit, I was told they could refer me to a neurosurgeon. It was just that easy. Like so many women, I was being dismissed by a doctor, a trained neurologist, and had my friend not given me that advice, I might have just become another suicide disease statistic. Also, like so many women, I had spent a lifetime smiling when I was told to and hiding my pain to not make others uncomfortable. Clearly, I'm not willing to do that anymore. Women need to be believed about their pain by medical professionals and those close to them, and they need to be able to talk about that pain openly like others discuss their diabetes, anxiety, or asthma. Until we remove the stigma surrounding pain-related conditions and disabilities and hidden disabilities, people, primarily women, will continue to suffer in solitude, perhaps with disastrous results. I would be remiss if I didn't give a shout out to my brain boo, who's held my hand every step of the way at Kaiser since I had brain surgery. They've been there in the darkest of times and most ridiculous of times, like when I caused my cerebrospinal fluid to leak because Metallica came on the radio. They also encouraged me, they also encouraged, by that I mean pushed hard for me to start advocating on behalf of trigeminal neuralgia warriors. Thanks to Supervisor Chavez for allowing me to help bring awareness regarding trigeminal neuralgia. Obviously, it really means a lot to me personally, but I also hope it's helped shift the conversation in general and we all take time to reach out more to our friends and family battling pain-related conditions and we encourage women not to be funny or smile at their own de detriment. On October 7, Please wear teal as part of International Trigeminal Awareness Day. We are now moving to public comment, which is the portion of the agenda set aside for members of the public wishing to address the Board of Supervisors on subjects, on topics not on today's agenda, but within the purview of the Board of Supervisors. We will begin with public commenters who are present in the chamber. So if you are intending to speak on this item, please take a yellow card from the back of the room and ensure that it gets to the clerk before the first person begins speaking. The in-person queue will close when the first person begins speaking. Happy to have as many of you as want to talk, just need to get those cards in. And for those of you who are on Zoom, you have a few additional moments. The Zoom queue will close when the first Zoom speaker begins speaking. Uh, Rhonda, how many speakers in total do we have right now? Currently, we have six speakers, five in person and one, uh, two on Zoom. That makes seven. 
Seven. Okay. Let me just give a another second or two. I don't see is anything coming down. Yes, Tina's waving. Three more. And the Zoom is coming up as well. We now have five in Zoom. Seven. Looks like we're going to have over 15. Over 15 speakers. When we have more than 15 speakers, we allot one minute for each speaker. So we will just still want to make sure that we have everything in. They're coming, and if uh, Rhonda, you could announce the the first the first speaker, and when this pile gets to to you, the queue will close, and let's begin. All right, if we could go ahead and have the first five speakers line up, we have Paul Soto, Charlotte Chen, Ellen Rollins, and Mark Trout. Go ahead. Uh, good morning, Mr. Blasius. My name is Paul Sutton from Horseshoe. Uh, we need to talk about taxing the homes in the red line districts in this county. We can't, we can't avoid that any longer. What I'm proposing is that we start taxing the equity in the homes in the red line districts at 1%. The hundred, first $100,000 of equity per year is exempt. Every single dollar after that first $100,000 is taxed at 1%. Now, when we're talking about racial equity, that would ensure the justice that is deserving of the Chicano community and the Mexicano community that suffered the generational consequences in the schools that was highlighted in Diaz versus San Jose Unified School District that was argued on behalf of the Chicano community by Judge Manley. So in that, in that <clears throat> we need to start talking about using that to generate a tax base to start financing these programs. Good morning, Bob Supervisors. My name is Charlotte Chen. I'm an outpatient pharmacist at Valley Medical Center, and I'm working at Food Co. for 18 years. Today, I'm here representing all the outpatient pharmacists here. Um, in May this year, outpatient pharmacists started COVID vaccination for 12 years and up, and in August, they, we started the six months and above. And just try to imagine a busy pharmacy setting with all this vaccination. As a result, two vaccination administration errors occurred shortly after this hasty implementation. Happened to a six-month-old baby and a five-year-old boy. Diverting pharmacists' focus from dispensing and checking prescription to handling young pediatric vaccination has created an unsafe and very dangerous patient care situation for the public. As geriatric population has grown over the years, diabetes on the rise, pharmacists found ourselves in a paramount role in checking and dispensing safe and effective medication. If medication safety check is disrupted or hampered, it will become detrimental to overall health being of our county patients and will indirectly increase hospitalizations due to medication errors. Thank you. Good morning, supervisors and body. I'm back. <laughs> and I'm here at this particular time to introduce to you the new, you know, I turned 80 this year, so I can't keep things, I have to pass them on. And I would like to introduce Mr. Mashawn N. Kinsey. He is the new National Association of Juneteenth Lineage CEO. He's housed in Ventura in the Channel Islands. He is also the new California State Director of Juneteenth Lineage. And I just wanted to say thank you I'm well, and in those 15 months of transition, I never slept one day outdoors. Thank you. I appreciate it. If we could get the next five speakers ready, that's Carlos Fuentes, Sean, Surrender, and Marsha Porsche. 
and Julie Barajas. Go ahead, Mark. Ken Yeager gave us the invocation, the shameless invocation. You know, uh, under Old Testament law, the kings uh, were required to handwrite their own copy of the Tanakh or the Old Testament, same books, uh, so that they would know how to be good kings, okay? Good governors. That's how they would know, by what God said. Now, there were three kings. Uh, they were all compromisers. Josiah was one of them. He, he tore down the houses of the Sodomites. And then Asa and Jehoshaphat, I believe it was, they deported the Sodomites. But that fell far short of what the holy law of God required, okay, which was stoning to death because of what they did. Okay, and you're promoting it. This is not right. This is the overthrow of government. Just like Jesus said it would happen, the shaking of the heavens. Okay. Carlos? Uh, good morning. Uh, I'm here today to discuss TSS decision to, to delete an IT project coordinator position and add an IT field support specialist. Currently, TSS has two permanent IT project coordinator positions and one unclassified position. There are over 72 IT field support, special, uh, field support specialists with 13 senior positions. TSS stated that this change will support the operational need for the organization. However, we respectfully request the board to reconsider TSS recommendation on this add and delete proposal as we um, believe this is negatively impact our members' opportunity to uh, and ability to advance within the organization. The IT project coordinator role serves as an entry level position in the project management family. As and losing one of these two positions would impede our members' of, uh, aspirations to pursue careers in this field. It's important to note that this is the only project manager position that does not require PMP certification. Deleting this position will li will limit the opportunity for SEIU employees to transition into project management field. Thank you. Thank you, Sean. Mark Trout is the least Christian person I know and a bigot. But that's not why I came here. Um, I came because I want to make sure that everyone knows that the NAACP delivered a letter to the Sunnyvale Shelter, putting them on notice for firing uh, black employees. In the last two years, the majority of employees that they fired at the Sunnyvale Shelter are black. Um, they also fired an unhoused uh, black employee who had just been housed and now their housing, they are likely to lose their housing. Um, and I just want to make sure that you're aware of that. Uh, the NAACP is also uh, getting them legal representation. So I'm letting you know, because Home First is one of your largest um, providers of uh, homeless outreach, and uh, they provide care at several of the shelters. So I'm just letting you know, I think that this is an important issue and that you should follow through, and there will be more about this soon. Thank you. Thank you, Surrender. Last name Avant. I'm here today because I went to court about a month and a half ago, and there was a multicolored defendants there. As they were there, there were two Negro defendants there. And they were, they didn't have any financial means to get out of jail. And they said they no longer had a zero tolerance, I mean a zero balance or whatever. So I just wanted to bring to court, I mean, well, to you as the court today, that at least make it that they can give a dollar so they can get out of jail? Because these people are indigent. But the other people who committed worse crimes walked out of that door. And I'm tired of these Negroes being locked up in this society and nobody care. Everybody gets to walk out free and we will too. Thank you. Thank you, Marcia. Yeah, I'm sorry, there was kind of a mix-up in the line. Um, 
I'm Surinder. Um, it's public everywhere that I've declared myself king. Um, and anyone can think I'm crazy. I've already been locked in a mental hospital where I got out, uh, where I was illegally held. And uh, reviewing some of the notes recently, one of the doctors uh, said a little thank you for allowing them, her, to uh, see this interesting patient. So I appreciate that comment. I am interesting. Uh, but what's more important is I haven't seen my son in two years almost. And uh, I spend a lot of time in prayer and I'm really tired of this life right now, you know? People, on 9-11, someone from our Sikh Gurdwara threatened to call the police and say I'm suicidal. I've already been on a 5150 and I wasn't suicidal then and I'm not suicidal even after two years of not seeing my son. The reason? Because we all pray the same. We're Sikhs, we pray the same, we wake up every day, we, we are motivated to change people's lives, to enlighten people and bring awareness to violations of human rights. My human rights have been violated. You all have done nothing. But I have an attorney now, and I'll be running. Thank you. Next speaker, please. OK, so I'm Marsha Porch. That was, I'm not sure. <laughs> it's OK. Um, I'm an e eligibility worker at um, the Application Assistance Center um, on Center Road, one of the eligibility workers. I was also one of the eligibility worker negotiators during this last contract. Over the years, our workload has continued to increase, and unfortunately, our clients are suffering as there are many backlogs. The lack of planning and implementation of CalSAWS only exacerbates the problem. We tried to bring these issues to management at the time, but it fell on deaf ears. Like everything that we try to do, it falls on deaf ears and nothing gets done. Hello, I'm Julie Barajas. I'm going to finish on with that. Um, Julie Barajas, South County eligibility worker for our Medi-Cal only. During contract negotiations, the county failed to recognize any issue outside of CalSAWS, but insisted on a side letter only to address CalSAWS issues. County stated that they did not have authority to bargain caseloads and could not provide requested data needed to improve the services of our community. We understand that the county, I mean, that the state wants us all to be on one system, but it's really our clients that are suffering with the amount of backlog that we have currently right now. And we try to address it during negotiations. Thank you. Good morning, my name is Rosalina Nunez and I'm a general, I'm a general assistant and intake worker. And I, I was also a negotiator during the last contract. In good faith, we came to an agreement on the side letter. However, we can see that management is already not holding up their end of the bargain. By sending emails to the workers, recru recruiting our represented workforce to serve on the innovation committee for the county. We want to enter into the committee in good faith to better serve our clients, and we, we are hoping that the county comes with the same intentions. Thank you. And that concludes our in-person speakers. Thank you. How many speakers do we have on Zoom, please? It looks like we currently have seven. We okay. did have eight, so I just want to make sure if there's somebody whose hand was lowered erroneously, please re-raise it. Thank you for giving that a, a second or so. I'll remind our uh, participants on Zoom that the queue for speaking will close when the first person begins speaking. So I wanted to give it another second or two to see if hands continue to go up. And if not, uh, we will cap it at the eight speakers. All right, it looks like our eighth did rejoin and no new. So our first speaker is Sabrina. Sabrina, I've asked you to unmute. Please accept the unmute. You'll have one minute to speak. Hi, good afternoon, board. I'm here today to echo and support what was said by Charlotte Shun, um, the second speaker today, and the rest of the ambulatory pharmacists that are in online today watching. We are committed to advocating safe changes that improve patient care. 
Pharmacists who find themselves in situations where the welfare of others is in question should always pause and evaluate the situation and take the steps necessary to ensure safe and optimal care. I advise us to support and listen to what Charlotte Chung told us today. It is very important and it is affecting our pediatric care. Thank you so much. Thank you. Our next speaker is Michael Celso. We've asked you to unmute. Please accept the unmute. You will have one minute to speak. Good morning. Um, oh, my name is Michael Celso. I'm an associate clinical social worker working at the Behavioral Health Call Center for the past year. I live in District 4. I'm here to ask the board to encourage the Behavioral Health Department to stop the practice of continuous forced overtime, which the department terms on call, of, all, of call center clinicians to provide 24-7 and weekend coverage. Call center, call center clinicians must be by our computers to perform our work and cannot go about our days. We must stay in our remote workspace and perform the exact same functions as we do when working remotely during normal business hours. So it is in every sense overtime and not on-call work. Call center clinicians are sleep deprived, overworked, and undercompensated. The department needs to provide alternate shifts, which provide 24 seven coverage within a 40 hour work week or outsource the after hours while they work with the union on a long-term solution. The current practice of mandatory overtime under the false pretext of on-call work needs to stop. Thank you. Our next speaker is Nam Thai. Nam, I've asked you to unmute. Please accept the unmute. You will have one minute to speak. Hi, this, my name is Nam Thai. I work with Michael Celso, the previous speaker. I am a psychiatric social worker working at Behavioral Health Call Center for the last five years. From March of 2020 to August of this year, I have volunteered to work after hours beyond my regular 40 hour work week due to staff shortage and being the essential worker during the height of the pandemic. Now the pandemic is over, I'm exhausted and burned out. I want to resume my regular work week of 40 hours a week. Call center management continue to mandate me to work after hour on call against my will with the threat of termination of employment if I fail to comply with their mandate. I'm here to ask the board to intervene on my behalf and behalf of my fellow clinicians to demand that the call center management to number one, hire enough staff to cover the, the phone 24 seven. Number two, stop having us working around the clock like machines as soon as possible. And to see us as a valuable. Thank you. Our next speaker is Mitra Gain. Mitra, I've asked you to unmute. Uh, hi, this is Mitra. I am a clinician at the call center also, and uh, I have been working overtime for the last two or three years, and now I am really burnt out. I do not want to work overtime, but I've been forced to work overtime against my will. It is impacting my health, my sleep, my family, and I, uh, I do not want to um, continue this. Um, we are 24-7, and uh, we need to have staff for 24-7. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Diem. Diem, I've asked you to unmute. Please accept the unmute. You'll have one minute. DM. Hello. Hello. Yes, Go ahead. Yes, hi. Thank you. My name is Diem Ye. I'm also a clinician at the Behavioral Health Call Center, which is the entrance point to Santa Clara County Behavioral Health Services, serving 2,000, 2 million people in the county. I've worked with the call center for 14 years. I work with the, I'm sorry, call center for 14 years, the county for 23 years. I work on call for the straight 14 years with the laps of time of not volunteering to work due to being burnt out physically and mentally. The recent mandatory to cover 24 hours have greatly impacted my family. I'm not available to attend my children's school meetings 
and events. Their, their paid um, activities were missed because I had to be at home to attend the calls. The anxiety and stress to adhere management's directive of providing around the clock coverage has allowed me to not be present to my family. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Melissa. Melissa, I've asked you to unmute. Hello, good afternoon. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Melissa, and I, I would like to echo um, everything that my colleague Charlotte Chun had said. Um, I'm, I'm here to support what she said and, and urging the board to um, ask management to support their proposal as they are closest to the issue. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Thou. Thou, I've asked you to unmute. Hello, hi, um, my name is Tao, and I'm one of the pharmacists at the county here. Um, we're, I'm on this call because to express the concern that Charlotte brought up earlier about um, pharmacy now vaccinating three years and up. Um, we've always done 12 and up. Three years and up is a very critical age for children and having pharmacy where we are an outpatient pharmacy where we take care of patients leaving the hospital constant and making sure that they get the medications and take it correctly. To vaccinate children at such a young age that are not, we don't have the environment to provide the safety, the friendliness, or the time to vaccinate such a young age group. We believe that that age group should be vaccinated by the pediatrician and the pediatric nurses to have the special training to do this. So we would hope the Board of Supervisors would take this into consideration and talk to our management team about this. Thank you. Thank you. And our final speaker today is Adelina. Adelina, I've asked you to unmute. Adelina, are you there? Adelina appears to be, un oh, there can we go. Yep, now we can hear you, thank you. I'm also working at the Behavioral Health Call Center and I'm here to support my fellow clinicians. I'm also a psychiatric social worker. I've been in the county since 1997. And I just wanna emphasize that we are the entry point to all mental health and substance abuse treatment in the county. And they only have seven clinicians to man the call center for 24 seven. Can you imagine that? Seven clinicians that are being forced to man 24 seven clinic. Okay, this is to take all calls for mental health and substance abuse. And we are being threatened to be written up and fired if we do not work 24 seven. We're asked to get up at midnight, work throughout the night, and then start our day from eight to five again and then work from 5 to 1 a.m. and work 24 hours on the weekends. I am very upset right now because. And that concludes our speakers. Thank you very much. Our next item today is, public, is um, to approve the consent calendar and changes to the Board of Supervisors agenda. I see you're gearing up for the, <laughs> for the reading of the consent calendar, Rhonda. Let's uh, go when you're ready. Actually, today's consent calendar is a really nice one. Today, we have a request from President Ellenberg to add items 9, 16, and 17 to the consent calendar. Item 9 is to receive the report from the Office of the District Attorney relating to strengthening diversion programs. Item number 16 is to consider recommendations relating to the proposed request for proposals for the 2025 Garbage Recycling and Organics Franchise Agreements for residential and commercial accounts in unincorporated Santa Clara County. Item number 17 is to receive a report relating to efforts to facilitate compliance with the Levine Act and maximize public access to related information. 
There's a request from Supervisor Chavez to delete item number 37. Item number 37 is to consider recommendations relating to sponsorship of Vovivinam America to support the 2023 Children's Moon Festival. And that concludes the consent calendar. Thank you very much. I will look down the aisle for uh, additional comments and I'll begin with Supervisor Arenas. Thank you. Um, President Ellenberg, I'd like to um, have you reconsider the, the recommendation for item 16 to be placed on consent calendar. I'd like to leave that on, on our regular agenda, please. Absolutely, we will do. Thank you. Excuse the interruption, that number again was? 16. One six. One six. Thank it's you. the garbage recycling and organics franchise agreement. And just um, quickly checking, Rhonda, is that a three or four vote item? Item sixteen. It's a three vote. It's okay. Okay. Anything else, Supervisor Arenas? Supervisor Chavez. Nothing. Supervisor Simidian. Thank you, uh, Madam President. I'd like to ask. Uh, County Council about item 26 and um, I'm just curious why this is not a Levine Act item uh, and forgive me for not asking prior to the meeting but I just as I'm doing my final final reviews <coughs> this is an agreement with the University of California I don't know if the fact that it's the state has some impact um, but it's a Agreement for services involves a quarter of a million dollars. Thank you, Supervisor. I'm going to ask uh, Chief Assistant County Counsel Kavitha Narayan to answer that question. Good morning, Supervisor. So this is an agreement with um, the University of California, San Francisco, which is another governmental entity. Governmental entities cannot make campaign contributions. Uh, there are some contracts with other governmental entities that are marked as Levine Act items where they could have participants, members of the public who are sort of sufficiently impacted by the item that their uh, contribution could make them a participant. On this one, we deem there was no such nexus for individual members of the public. Thank you. Um. That being said, uh, we've been advised that certain items on the consent calendar may be subject to the Levine Act, as indicated in the language in our published agenda. Specifically, we've been advised that items 22, 27, 28, 33, 34, 35, 36, 37, 38, 39, 40, 41, 42, 50, 51, 52, 53, 60, 65, 66, and 67 on the consent calendar may be subject to the Levine Act. We've also been advised that pursuant to state law, any party or their agents must disclose on the record a contribution of more than $250 made to a board member, as described on page three of our agenda. So I want to ask at this time that if any party or agent has made such a contribution, that they disclose that contribution immediately so that I may promptly recuse myself. I would also ask that if any participant in these proceedings, as defined by the Levine Act, has made such a contribution, that they disclose that contribution immediately so that I may promptly recuse myself. And I would also ask that if any employee of the County Council's office or of the Clerk of the Board's office or any other member of county staff or any member of the public knows of any reason I should recuse myself under the Levine Act, that they please disclose that information immediately so that I may promptly recuse myself. Thank you, Madam Chair and colleagues. Additionally, I would like to ask that item 17, that is 1-7, uh, remain in its um, uh, regularly agendized place on our agenda today. And Madam Chair, I note, uh, if I may, through the Chair, that you've asked that item 9 also be added to the consent calendar uh, I just wonder, do we know if that's a problematic from the perspective of the district attorney who is, I believe, the provider of that report? The report is in the, um, is in the agenda, so we have the, the materials for it. If you'd like to hear the item, we'll keep it off of No, I just want to be respectful to the mm -hmm. district attorney's office and not sort of unilaterally preclude their engagement or participation on the item. If they want to weigh in, they may think that this is 
found time and can <laughs> do some other work. But uh, I'll leave that one alone for the moment. I'll just uh, raise the concern and I will indicate that if the district attorney's office came rushing into the room saying they'd like the item to be heard, uh, I would probably ask that we give them time. Um, thank you very much. My only request then is item number 17 remain on the uh, regular agenda. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Lee. In the spirit of trying to move things along, I'd like to add items 10 and item 12 to consent. I'm um, to refer from Supervisor Smitty and Chavez for greater access to private sector mental health services. Item 12 is a referral from Supervisor Smitty, uh, discussing about the Oakland roles and duties. And I'm going to ask that item 10 remain on the regular agenda. Uh, I think item 12 can be dispensed with happily uh, on the consent calendar. Thank you. All right. Um, I would like to record abstentions on items 59 and 71. Item 15 is the DA's military equipment use policy, and item 71 is the second reading of the sheriff's military equipment policy. Uh, I'll abstain consistent with prior votes. Uh, and I have brief comments on several additional items, not, uh, none of which need to be removed. Item 26 is an agreement with UCSF to conduct a behavioral health workforce needs assessment. I want to thank all of the county departments and community partners who are working to expand our behavioral health capacity since the board declared mental illness and substance use uh, disorder a public health crisis in January of last year. As the county continues to add beds, we also need to expand the workforce. I'm very glad to approve the agreement and I look forward to working with my colleagues in administration to engage our local academic and community partners in this work. Uh, my team will reach out to Dr. Tarao to see how um, uh, I or, or any of my colleagues who so desire can encourage participation by our strategic partners. Item 27 is the amendment to the agreement with Valley Health Foundation for the Wellness Center grants. Here again, I want to thank staff for working to bring this item back so quickly and to note um, for my colleagues in the public that there has been a strong response from school districts thus far with 18 school districts noting their intent to apply ahead of the October 20th deadline. Item 55 is to accept funds for county council to recover some expenses as part of the opioid settlements. These dollars are separate from the damages that were awarded to support opioid misuse prevention and treatment. I want to recognize county council for their tremendous work at the forefront of the opioid lawsuits. While our service departments are focused on providing direct care for residents, the work that county council pursues in their sphere to advance the health and well-being of residents is a vital asset to our community as well, and I, I just wanted to shine some light on that. Um, Supervisor Smidian, something additional? So what I have gathered, Rhonda, and let's see if we are on the same page, is that item 12 will be moved to consent. Item, items 16 and 17 will remain on the regular calendar. And everything else is as is? Item nine. Yes. Oh, item nine is at the moment staying on item consent. Item nine it remains on consent. So we're gonna, I, I'm, I will say that we will keep that on consent, nine. All right. Uh, All let's right. Let's take public comment, please. Um, we currently have no public comment, but before we take the vote, I do need to read a statement. Oh, yes, you do. Thank you. Items on the consent calendar may be subject to the Levine Act as indicated in the language on the published agenda. Any party or their agents must disclose on the record a contribution of more than $250 made to a board member as described on page three of the agenda. Participants who have a financial interest and their agents are requested are requested to make a similar disclosure. That concludes my statement. Thank you very much. Do we have public speakers on the consent calendar? We do not. All right, let's vote, please. Um, um, we need a motion. Do we have to approve the consent calendar and changes. That's second. Stated. Thank you. Motion by Lee, second by Arenas. Thank you. Supervisor Arenas. Yes. Supervisor Chavez. Yes. Supervisor Smidian. Aye. Vice President Lee. Aye. President Ellenberg. Uh, yes, with the abstentions previously mentioned. Thank you. Motion carries. 
Thank you very much. Uh, item eight is set for time certain at 1 p.m., so we will hold off on that. Item nine, we approved on consent. So our first item uh, to hear today is the item 10, the mental health parity, impact litigation, and legislative efforts. And who do we have for that presentation? Oh, I'm sorry, it is a ref it is a referral from Supervisor Suminian. Of course, Thank it would not be on consent. My apologies. Thank you very much, uh, Madam President and colleagues. Uh, I will ask that we move the recommended action and will indicate um, that this is one of those areas where you ask, how long do we have to wait? Um, and. Um, not only will I move the recommended action as contained in the public agenda, but I will specifically ask that the action by our county council's office uh, include an assessment of our own employee insurers, uh, which is an issue that Supervisor Chavez and I have both raised previously. So I just want to add that to the recommended action on packet page 86. Um, I say how long do we have to wait because Second. It was in, thank you for the second, uh, and I meant to uh, say thank you to Supervisor Chavez for co-authoring with me. Um, I say how long do we have to wait because it was in 1996, more than a quarter of a century ago, that Congress passed the Federal Mental Health Parity Act, uh, which was a beginning of the fairly common sense notion that health care is health care, whether it is for physical health or mental health. Uh, and yet here we are a quarter of a century later with folks who uh, think they have good insurance but who nevertheless struggle uh, to get the health care uh, they need, they deserve, and that quite frankly they have paid for uh, through their insurance premiums. And um, the state, like many other states in the country, has weighed in uh, back in 1999, just three years after the Federal Act. Uh, the California Mental Health Parity Act uh, was passed, that was AB 88. Uh, and yet, uh, and I can't help resist reading the headline from uh, an April 2000 scholarly journal, Health Services Research. Uh, the headline in the story or the article is, Mental Health Parity Legislation, Much Ado About Nothing? Question mark. And uh, it, you know, anticipated the fact that uh, here we are, as I keep saying, quarter of a century later, uh, without the necessary um, protections in place or enforcement in place to make this notion real. Uh, shout out to my former colleague, Supervisor Jim Bell, later Senator Jim Bell, who was raising this issue long ago and uh, who's been a champion and advocate in the field. Um, to their credit, I suppose, the folks in Congress, the feds, I realized that the 1996 measure wasn't getting the job done, so in 2008, um, the uh, Congress passed the new legislation, the Mental Health Parity and Addiction Equity Act. Uh, you know, it took almost a decade and a half, as I say. And now, a decade and a half after that, we've got federal rulemaking because the folks at the federal level and I think three different cabinet level departments have essentially acknowledged that the work still isn't being done, that people aren't getting the help they need, and so they're trying through the federal rulemaking process to be uh, a little bit more ambitious or aggressive about uh, making this real, and that is the reason for the referral. Um, whether it's litigation, whether it's uh, advocacy at the legislative level, uh, or advocacy around rulemaking, uh, there is a role for us to play here. We've done it before with opioids, we've done it before with lead paint. We have the ability to, I think, weigh in with real impact on an issue of national importance and that could not be more timely. And that is why I have made the motion and appreciate Supervisor Chavez's co-authorship and second. I ask for an I vote. Thank you. I. I um First, I wanted to thank um, Supervisor Simidian. I, I, I actually believe that um, the county has been forced to expand services because the private sector hasn't done their job. Not even an expansion, just in what they've told the public they're doing. Um, and so what I'm hopeful of is that as our um, legal team takes a look at this, that we really are thinking about this both from a consumer perspective and also governmentally, like 
what are we what are we obligated to do because others aren't doing their part? And then lastly, I'm very interested in understanding how contractual agreements, not just between um, the county and our, our health partners, but every single entity, private sector and public sector, that has contracts with the um, private providers have an opportunity to do more to either right-size what we're paying or right-size the services. I, to me, in some respects, um, when you don't have when you don't have access, I, I have been thinking a lot about the whether or not. Well, I, I'm not being a lawyer. How about I not just start speculating what I think the challenges are? I'll let you all do that. Um, but I wanted to really thank um, Supervisor Samidian because I I do think that um, I have a lot of confidence in our team's ability to um, to really dive into this and and frankly, to be part of creating a national movement about accountability, mutual accountability, and and I think it's a way for us to address affordability in the long run. So thank you, uh, Joe, for thinking of this. Thank you. Do we, oh, Supervisor Lee? Yeah, just very briefly. We've often heard justice delayed is justice denied. There's no different from mental health. Mental health care delayed is mental health care denied. And I just want to thank my colleagues, my off awesome colleagues, Spices um, Samidi and Spices Chavez for leading on this effort uh, of this referral of using the power of the law. Uh, we know organizations like uh, Southern Poverty Law Center have used the law to make sure that we get equity um, in, in, in racial discrimination for so many years. Uh, in this case here, we're basically having the same concept of let's get the lawyers involved, let's find out what the problem is, and let's use the law to make sure that these access are being made available. So thank you for, for that effort. Thank you. Supervisor Smidian. The only last word would be to say I, I fully understand in the making of the motion that this is not a next week, next month, or maybe even next year proposition. Um, I, I had to smile when we finally got uh, some accountability around the lead paint issue because I uh, voted to initiate that legislation in the late 1990s and then of course it was 20 years later uh, that the issue finally circled back. Um, but I think it's pretty clear as I said that we haven't seen the progress that we should have seen over these last 25 years. and. Um, uh, you know, I always hope for results sooner rather than later, but if this is uh, something that our team needs to carry on uh, long after any of the five of us are uh, uh, on this board, so be it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Do we have public speakers on this item? We do not. We have a motion by Oh, actually, we do one. Sorry, my apologies. That's all right. So none in chambers? None in chambers. All right, for folks who are on Zoom, um, if you're intending to speak on this item, item 10, a referral by Supervisors Simidian and Chavez, now is the time to raise your virtual hand. The queue will close when the first speaker begins. All right, our first speaker, it looks like we're holding at one, is Michael. Michael, we've asked you to unmute. Please accept the unmute, and you will have Two minutes to speak. Hi, my name is Mike Rogers. I applaud Supervisor Sabidian Chavez and Board of Supervisors for taking this item up. Uh, it's appalling to me when I see family members that have been in stress with mental health issues in recent years who have health insurance that is supposed to provide services for this, but it's practically not available because uh, appointments are uh, literally uh, a month or more out in advance when somebody's got a mental health issue. It's usually much more imminent than the services are, be, are able to be provided. I'm not going to mention the <laughs> large entities here in the Valley that are you know, major insurers that have large portions of population by name, but I appreciate uh, the county taking up the surgeon issue. Um, especially with respect to the uh, declared mental health emergency since January of last year. Thank you. And that concludes our speakers. Thank you. Uh, let's vote on the item, please. Motion by Samidi and second by Chavez. All right. Supervisor Arenas? Yes. Supervisor Chavez? Yes. Supervisor Samidian? Yes. Vice President Lee? Aye. President Ellenberg? Yes. Motion carries. Thank you. 
Uh, item 11 is a referral from Supervisors Lee and Simidian on Veteran Services Office Staffing. Thank you, uh, Madam President. I will simply move the recommended action as contained in our published agenda. Uh, this is item 11, packet page 88, uh, with the brief introductory observation. Um, these are positions that are, in my assessment, undeniably necessary to get veterans in our county the benefits to which they are lawfully entitled, which they have earned, and which they deserve. Uh, some of the work we do is understandably uh, theoretical, abstract. There's nothing theoretical or abstract about these positions. Uh, we know that uh, staffing is a chronic challenge, not only in our own uh, County Veterans Service Office, but uh, frankly at the VA as well, as the demand increases and um, there continues to be, I think, a certain sense of overload. Um, but again, these are positions that will, uh, to some degree, modest degree, be uh, uh, reimbursed with uh, other, other government funds, uh, so the full burden doesn't fall on us. But most importantly, every single one of these people is going to be a guarantee that folks in our county get the benefits they deserve, which is, makes them not only a little more whole, but a, a little bit less of uh, weight on the shoulders of the larger county organization. And the last thing I'll say is if in the last item I was frustrated that uh, we say we're taking action in a quarter of a century later, we haven't. On this item, I'm frustrated that uh, our nation does a, a pretty good job of telling veterans how much we value them. We do a less good job, frankly, on making that real when they return to civilian life. And this is an opportunity to not just talk the talk, but walk the walk. I appreciate uh, colleague Otto Lee joining me as a co-author on this, and I'll ask for a second from him, if I second. may, Madam Chair. Thank you. Do we have public speakers on this item? We do have one in-person speaker, Cole Cameron. Thank you for bringing this to this chair uh, with the recommendations of adding these additional people. We've got over 64,000 vets in the county. We have a major increase in their workload with the PACT Act expanding possibilities. Uh, I sent an email I received on how overloaded uh, the VA is, and I know our own team is. Uh, we have Steve Hondacaro, our acting director, with us for any questions you might have. Uh, Darlene Escalante, who is the key primary uh, person in the office, has been a trainer. She put on the uh, stand down. Uh, she's created some videos that are now a statewide standard. That's how wonderful she is. So besides the overload from the PACT Act, our own VSO office, there's also the need for this promotion ladder up through director so that we don't lose these good people because it takes a long time to train them. So I just really hope that uh, we can find the money as a old finance guy myself here in Silicon Valley. I understand the numbers game and I appreciate the consideration by each of you in uh, helping these people out. Uh, as you've heard in other departments and other speakers today, there's an overload going on with short staff across the board. And I hope we can resolve this one for our 64,000 vets. Thank you very much for your time this morning. As I said, uh, Steve is here for any questions you might have in, in more detail, and we'd be happy to meet with you offline in further discussions. Thank you very much. That concludes our speakers. Thank you very much. Um, I have a, just a brief comment as as well, I want to thank everyone involved in the, the recent uh, Veterans Stand Down event. I absolutely appreciate the leadership on this issue and also want to make sure that we are allocating the appropriate resources to this important service. So uh, thank you. 
Supervisors Sumidian and Lee for bringing staffing issues in the Veterans Services Office to our attention. Um, I certainly don't question, have no doubt that there is more work than can be managed in this. Um, and as, as several of you, you noted, virtually, likely virtually all of our departments. What I'm struggling with here is that outside of the budget process, we can't weigh the need for additional FTEs in this department against greater or lesser urgency for additional FTEs in, in other departments. Uh, to some extent, I, I'm also thinking about the cognitive dissonance our employees may be feeling as, as, as administration talks about, and, and we'll hear later in the budget item today, asking departments to identify reductions and not add more personnel in the board adds positions, but potentially without, um, you know, without a full operational analysis of how to best deploy our limited funds. I would be more comfortable, um, and I, I don't know if the, the maker or, or seconder would consider this, but I would be more comfortable approving a referral that directs administration to consider the recommended additions during the mid-year budget. Um, if, if that's the case, I, I would be happy to support this today um, but otherwise, I'm, I'm just not comfortable supporting this very well-intentioned uh, referral. And finally, regarding adding positions overall, I'd always like to see estimates of actual expected costs, as my colleagues included in their referral today, um, accounting for offsetting revenues as well as an analysis of service delivery needs. So that's a general budget comment. I, I like the way this was this was presented, but but can't quite get there if we're gonna make this determination um, sort of outside of a, a full analysis. Madam Chair, I'm gonna leave the motion on the floor as it stands. I okay. would make the case, uh, I appreciate the issues that you're raising, I would make the case that we are in fact respecting and reflecting the budget process. These, these positions, just three, in an organization with 20 to 23,000 people, three positions, uh, are specifically called out, not for action today, but as but through and as part of the mid-year budget uh, process. So I think that is the appropriate time, place, and venue for that. There are a larger set of issues. I'm sorry, can you? I didn't understand no, I, that. Can you just restate? Yeah, what we're you just we're said? not we're not saying these positions are funded as of today. We're saying fund them when we get to the mid-year budget process. We're not saying consider them. To, which was your request as I understood right. it. We're saying fund them in the mid-year budget process, which is a, the timely opportunity in uh, my experience to take appropriate budget action. So uh, that's a time when the administration presumably will come to us with a number of other adjustments. Uh, and um, rather than have administration pop up at that time and say, oh, we're taken by surprise, um, what we're trying to do is say now, in advance of that mid-year budget process, this is something that uh, we are directing you to address. Uh, if the um, number were larger than the relatively small number of three folks, uh, I think the concern might be a, a more um, fulsome one, but uh, truth be told, uh, three folks isn't gonna get the job done. Uh, it is the tip of the iceberg. Uh, it's undeniably necessary in uh, my view and the view of others who are more knowledgeable than I, quite frankly. And it is um, the reason that the way the language of the uh, item is structured is to, in fact, approve a referral. I'm looking at B, 11B, approve a referral to administration to report the board as part of the development of the fiscal year 24-25 budget including a plan to address additional VSO staffing as necessary and appropriate, and then including the particular positions. So I would, I would make the case that the bulk of this really is referred to our June budget process, that the immediate need, which is clearly pressing, um, is uh, being addressed in a pretty modest way, that it's being addressed at the time it should be in the mid-year budget review, and finally, just to put a little more human um, face to all this, um, and I'm guessing Supervisor Lee knows these numbers all too well, the suicide rate among veterans is 50% higher than it is among the general public. 
More than 40% of veterans experiencing homelessness are people of color, and the disability rate among veterans is more than twice that of the general adult population. So if this were a nice to have rather than a have to have, I might be persuaded to delay, but it's for those reasons that I would hope we can get a majority of the board to vote aye today. Thank you. Thank you very much. I, I appreciate the, uh, the further explanation, and certainly the mid-year is the appropriate time to consider it. I'm not comfortable pre-determining today what we're going to decide in the, in the mid-year, so that doesn't, um, that doesn't really impact my decision. Certainly the needs are great, and, and the needs are great in so many uh, departments and areas of critical work in our county. This is what we do. We serve the most vulnerable residents. Um, so while I, I very much appreciate the, the passion, I, I am going to uh, stick to a principle of making these decisions um, at, um, at our mid-year conversation. And certainly if there is a majority today, we will, we will go with that and move ahead. Let me hear from Supervisor Lee, then Arenas, then Chavez. Thank you. Um, first, I want to thank uh, Supervisor Smithian for your leadership and support for this very important referral supporting our veterans in our county. Uh, during my visit to the uh, Veteran Services Office, VSO, I also learned that about over 3% of our county's residents are veterans, which comes out to be about over 64,000 veterans living in our county. But we currently only have 12 funded VSRs, the Veteran Service Representatives at the VSO office. This proposal is about adding three more VSRs, which is about 25% more capacity to process these very complicated veterans' benefits applications. How complicated they are? When I returned from Iraq in 2010, I tried to put that application in. And after logging so many times, that application is still not being submitted. <laughs> I'm telling you, even a lawyer with a degree it, it still can't get it done. And trust me, this application are not designed for regular human to complete. And that's why it is so needed to have these VSRs to be there to help them to get these filled out. In 2022, the statistic shows that we have over 6,300 physical visits from veterans to our VSO office, along with making over 20 1,000 emails and calls with our veterans. These are good numbers, but when we have 64,000 veterans in our county, we're only reaching out to about a third, leaving us with over two-thirds of 42,000 more veterans that really need to be contacted or served. Our VSO's goal is to serve at least 90% of all our veterans, so we fall far short of that. In addition to more staffing the VSO as well, we also want to uh, mention that there is a pretty high turnover, over 30% among these VSRs. And we need to figure out what are the ongoing training, what upward mobility are really needed to also support the career growth. So this is something that needs to be worked on as well. And as, as I mentioned, being a veteran myself, I absolutely believe this is a very important uh, resource. Uh, and uh, uh, one more thing is by ob obtaining these resources to these veterans, they will be using the resources, i.e. disability funds, to be spent in our county. So I absolutely believe that thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of uh, dollars per year will be brought in by having these uh, veterans being compensated as they so deserve. So I respectfully request an eye vote from all my colleagues. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Arenas, and then Chavez. Uh, sure, thank you. Um, My, my heart tells me I, I want to support this uh, referral because it is absolutely noble and I respect uh, those folks who are brave enough to serve in this capacity, um, which I don't include myself in this. Um, so I, I admire, I really admire the men and women who serve our country uh, this way. Um, so there's the part of me that is is very um, empathetic to to this cause, 
Um, and then there is the other part of me that thinks about what we have been saying for some time now about um, strategically aligning um, what we want to fund, um, the referrals that come in, um, the priorities that we have um, with a level of process. And earlier today, we heard from a number of employees that talked about um, how they're being mandated to work overtime or how they're um, being asked to really stretch thinly in their capacity, um, whether it's at a pharmacy or elsewhere. Um, and they need the support in order to continue to hold um, and support our community. Um, and so I, when you talked about like the cognitive dissonance, I was thinking, yes, how can we hear um, the pleas of our employees who are currently um, working really hard to just keep it together and then um, decide to uh, put our resources elsewhere. Um, and so for me, I think about what we have before us is, um, to me, makes more sense to integrate it in the budget process when the budget actually comes around. Um, today we will be having a, and this is, I feel like this is the cart before the horse because today we'll have a strategic budget planning conversation for 24-25 and we've been told that, um, you know, we're facing a substantial growing general fund deficit, we um, need budget reductions for next fiscal year and thereafter, um, so it's not just a one year um, strategy. Um, we're being asked, our county's being asked to reassess programs and policy initiatives to make sure that we um, comply with what's been mandated by law um, and uh, to make sure that we have the, the mission and the, high, uh, the county's mission and the highest priority needs um, in mind as well as being responsive to the current and emerging needs of the community. So there is so much that we haven't actually discussed that needs to be discussed in order for us to make decisions about what our next steps are because part of the recommendations in the staff memo is for us, uh, what, one of the strategies, um, if I remember correctly, is to ask, um, in order to, to close the gap that we're looking from operating cost and revenue that we see projected out to year uh, 27, fiscal year 27, 28, we're being, we're being asked um, for all of our county stakeholders, including our employees. So we're gonna ask our employees, hey, um, we encourage you to identify revenue generating opportunities and to maximize federal, state, and other revenue streams in areas for service efficiencies. So we're gonna ask you as employees to think about how can we um, generate more revenue? How can you be more efficient in your job? Um, and, uh, and to look for other opportunities to fund programs and services uh, that don't come from the general fund. We are going to ask our employees to do this for us, for our whole agency, and yet we are going to contradict that message um, by asking um, whether it, this is a very noble cause or not, um, to add positions to a budget that I don't know at this point if, if it's the most effective way to provide resources. I don't know what um, is missing. Um, I don't know what the problem that we're trying to solve for. And I, I understand and I hear loudly uh, that the, the suicide um, rate is higher among um, our veterans and especially our veterans um, who are people of color um, and uh, I want to make sure that we we are responsive to that we also need to make sure that we are being efficient in what we are asking to do and that we are looking at 
revenue generating opportunities. Um, and so I think that we need to lead by example. And if that's what we are going to ask our employees to do, that we do the same. Um, and so I, I won't be able to support this in this moment. I think that if this, this referral returns back during the budget uh, mid-year uh, timeframe, that we can then have a more informed, um, a more purposeful and strategic um, conversation about what is actually possible. And in the moment, I think if there is um, referrals that need to get uh, uh, augmented for our veterans, that we figure out how to do that within the system that we that is in place already, um, so that we are also efficient um, in what we are what we are doing. And so, anyways, I. I Unfortunately, we will not be able to support this. I, I do support our veterans and, and the efforts um, by both uh, um, supervisors, Samidian and Lee. Um, I just think that we need to make sure that we are also strategic in the conversations that, that we've already heard from our employees and the ones that we haven't had just yet about our uh, budget planning, strategic budget planning uh, later on in this meeting. Thank you. Supervisor, <coughs> Supervisor Chavez. Thank you. Um, you know, I, 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 let me start out by saying I think I just want to reinforce that I 100% believe that everybody up here wants to do what's right for all the folks that we serve and, and veterans specifically. So I, I just want to say that sometimes when we have these policy discussions, the way it gets interpreted by the public is we have a strong feeling one way or another about the issue that we're discussing. And I know that's not the issue with this crew. I'm so truly proud to serve with all of you. Um, you know, I, I, I'm gonna support this, and I'm, I'm gonna tell you three reasons why. One is um, our obligation here is that when we see something that's emergent or urgent, that as a board, we have the flexibility for a reason to lean in when we see something that is of high need. So that's the first issue. The second is that positions like this to get people signed up for benefits will alleviate other parts of our system. Our homeless system, our health system, every one of those systems, and for many, many, many people, especially in the veterans community, they, they want to be in a safe place to ask for services and, and help. And, and one of the only ways we're going to get them to do that is to go through this process. So I actually feel very confident that that in the end, um, that this will balance out in terms of our, our investment. The last thing that I just want to really um, lift up and acknowledge is that we have a number of areas that you talked about. I think um, Supervisor Arena said, I just want to say to my colleagues, a number of things that I heard today alarmed me enough that we should be considering whether or not we want to take um, not just mid-year budget action, but whether or not we want to give staff direction earlier as we see emergencies. I mean, that's one of the reasons that people reach out to us directly is that they somehow haven't been able to be heard in the organization. And I, I say that because I, I want to make sure that we don't constrain ourselves in a way that doesn't allow us to be effective. Now, having nothing to do with those three reasons, let me just say this to President um, Ellenberg in particular and to, to Supervisor Arenas. I think as a board, really creating um, structures is really critical, and so I appreciate you leaning in on that. I would also say that as we look to ways to balance the role of the board, we have to think about that relative to the entire organization, and that includes the staff, because to remind you, the amount of investments that, that we um, contribute to how the county has grown over the last even 10 years since I've been here has primarily been done by the administration, not by the board. And, and I, I don't say that as a criticism, it is genuinely an observation that means that in some ways this is a check and balance across both, both sides of the aisle, both the political and the administrative. So I'm, I'm very excited about this. I like the idea that it will be blended in as part of the um, you know, the, the mid-year budget, but I, but I do see this as something that's urgent and emergent and that we need to respond to now. Thank you. 
Thank you so much. I appreciate the comments of, of all of my, my colleagues and, um, and Supervisor Chavez, it's actually very compelling to think about um, the impact that this may have on easing other um, parts of, of our system. Um, I, I think that's, that is highly likely to be, to be very true. Um, for the other reasons that I that I said earlier, and um, uh, would very much echo Supervisor Arenas's comments, I'm going to um, stay where I am. Um, I will end up abstaining rather than voting no, because I want to make it ultra clear that this is not um, a move against the subject matter or any issue with veterans. Um, it's my my father uh, was an Army veteran and made very valuable use of, of VA services. Um, for me, this is about how we, how we make decisions um, in, in, a, in a system that, that like most others, has, has limited resources, and I want to make sure we do this in a, in a coordinated fashion. Um, so I think we know where everybody is. Supervisor Simidian, did you need to add something? Well, I, uh, I do want to take yes for an answer, uh -huh. given the count. That, that, <laughs> that said, and it may or may not bring uh, yet another member of the board on uh, to the I side, I, I do want to underscore <coughs> the fact that in order for these positions actually to be funded and filled, it will require a vote of our board at the January, February mid-year budget process um, so, you know, if people think at that time um, there are other higher priorities, fair enough, but um, it, it's not as if the decision that's being made today is an irrevocable one. It's one that will be taken up in the ordinary course of budget business uh, when we enter the new year. Thank you. Ask for an vote. Thank you. Do appreciate that. Um, one more minor. Yes, go ahead. Yeah, I just uh, want to thank my colleagues for these very uh, uh, thoughtful comments of how we try to balance the budget. This is not an easy job, and with the uh, negative uh, budgetary constraints that we keep hearing from the state and reminded from our county executive uh, that this is not uh, one of those decisions that we take lightly, And but the, the emergent and urgent need that we are seeing our veterans in our streets, uh, as we know, quarter of our unhoused populations are veterans. And these are hard facts. And so these are all going to help alleviate our system, which is really one of the most important things. Second of all, I just want to mention is that the, the, um, the VSO itself really needs the stability to know that there is funding coming up, help us on the way, so that they could actually be out there uh, interviewing and hiring folks come on board. I know the vote won't be taken until January, but these are not e really easy positions to fill. So I want to make sure the VSOs get the notice, get the word that help us on this way so that we could actually get these positions filled. People who are there understand that their job is secure and they'll be there longer, so instead of the high turnover that we're seeing. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, and it's uh, very clear that they will um, get those those services. Um, so I'm going to take, did you have a comment or a vote? Yes, just comment, one more please. comment. I, I appreciate um, everyone's perspectives, and, and thank you. Um, I know that there's, it's difficult, it's a, all of the decisions that are in front of us are, are complex, right? And there's so many different layers to it. Um, one of the things that I would like to bring out, and I wonder if, if uh, the maker of the motion would work with me on, um, because I do want to understand the issue better, I would like to understand why the high rate um, of turnover um, is happening in the, in the VSO. And I think when you, when, you t when you alert people that help is on their way, I'd like to actually have some help be on their way rather than um, wait until mid-year budget to actually take a look at this. So I think the analysis, or, or at least to help determine what the best strategies are in order to um, impact these positions and the high turnover rate could be um, done ahead of time, ahead of the mid-year budget. And so I'm wondering if that's something that we can uh, adjust in. I'm happy to make that commitment. Uh, I will just say today, 
it's an awkward conversation to have because the people you would ask typically would be our county staff. That puts the county staff in the difficult position of making the case for staffing in their office, which is historically frowned upon by the county executive's office, not to put too fine a point on it. Uh, my own assessment, based on some considerable research, uh, is that if you have a high level of demand and an inadequate number of folks to meet that demand, it creates burnout on the part of the people who are trying to do the work. And then what happens is you go into a doom loop, forgive the expression, because that means more people walk away from the job, which means you have fewer people still to do the work, which is growing. And then that means that the burnout increases, and that means more people walk away from the job, even as more people are seeking services. So one of the ways that we could address turnover, I'm sure it's not the only way, is by adequately staffing the office so that people who come to the work mm -hmm. um, know that they will be part of a team that is sufficiently staffed to get the work done. And this uh, challenge, as I referenced just in passing earlier on, um, is not unique to our, uh, our own VSO. It's something that I hear, and I'm less informed, frankly, about at the VA level as well. Uh, I'm somewhat attuned to that because we have a VA uh, presence that's pretty large in Palo Alto in the 5th District uh, and just across the county line in San Mateo uh, County where I used to represent the VA there as well. But I'm happy to work as we approach the mid-year budget with staff to uh, develop a, a white paper, if you will, on the issue of um, turnover uh, and vacancies uh, because I think um, I think you're, not that you need my agreement, but I think you're spot on about saying there's a larger structural issue here mm -hmm. that needs to be looked at at the same time, even as we provide um, a modest funding ad, uh, and uh, position addition. So I'll make that commitment Great, today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, again, I appreciate all of you. There was some, um, a little bit of just I, I want to get something straight here and I want to be careful if we if we are saying today um, and a majority of the board will that help is on the way that also you know really precludes the potential conversation at mid-year around as you mentioned supervisor submitting and that this really isn't a done deal we could we could say no then I, I really just want for the public um, to be to be clear as to whether this is happening now with the vote. The vote does direct um, these three positions, and it seems highly unlikely that um, that we would vote yes today and and no then. Uh, so I hope that's clear, and I and I hope that that brings um, some relief to to the veterans and the and the staff that will undoubtedly serve them well. Rhonda, let's vote on this item, please. Supervisor Arenas? I'm going to abstain. Supervisor Chavez? Yes. Supervisor Smidian? Aye. Vice President Lee? Aye. President Ellenberg? I will abstain as well. And Motion passes carries. with three. Thank you so much. Um, item 12 was handled on consent. Item 13 is the county executive's report. Good morning. I have a few items uh, to share with the board and the public. Uh, last week, the county launched our new web domain, SantaClaraCounty.gov, which is replacing sccgov.org. Seven redesigned websites under this domain are now up and running, including the county's homepage, the county news center, and the five uh, supervisorial district websites. As the board knows, this is only the beginning of the transition of our 90 or so public-facing websites. That transition will occur over time and won't conclude until the end of calendar year 2024. The new sites are designed to make it easier to navigate, search, and find services and information online, including enhanced access for individuals with disabilities. I want to thank our TSS team 
and the Office of Communications and Public Affairs, among others, for all of their effort to make the launch a success. Uh, Although people are focused on the 24 election cycle, we actually have an election coming up on November 7th of this year. There's a special election being held for both the Los Altos School District on a parcel tax and the San Jose Evergreen Community College District to fill a trustee vacancy. Ballots will be mailed out Monday, October 9th. Early voting at the ROV also opens on October 9th. Vote centers will be open from October 28th through November 7th and more information is available at sccvote.org. Uh, as the board knows, over the weekend, Congress did finally pass and President Biden signed a continuing resolution to, at the very last minute, avert a government shutdown. This is only a short-term 45-day continuing resolution. Congress has until November 17th, just a bit before Thanksgiving, to reach an agreement on either another continuing resolution or the actual underlying appropriations bills. We're gonna to continue to monitor this issue closely. Uh, we've provided the board uh, with public off agenda updates, including uh, one that we provided to the board today on the continuing resolution. Uh, finally, last Thursday at Hellyer Park, our employee services agency hosted a very successful career fair. We drew in around 1,300 participants who came to learn about county job opportunities. That's more than double the attendance at our inaugural career fair earlier this year. Teams from over 30 departments were in attendance to provide information and answer questions about rewarding careers in public service. I wanna give a huge thanks to ESA's HR department and all the other departments that participated in the career fair. And that concludes my report. Thank you very much. Turning next to our county council. There were no reportable actions taken at the October 2nd, 2023 closed session meeting. And that concludes my report. Thank you very much. President I, Ellenberg, just, oh yes. I just had one um, or a, a request and that is that we heard a lot of issues today in open set in the um, uh, public, comment. public comment. Thank you. And, among them, some of them were a little, I have to say, I was having a difficult time hearing all of the comments, um, but th I know one was related to pharmacy, um, our call center for behavioral health, and I just wanted to make sure that when, when our employees come and speak, that there is a, a response from the administration that is shared with the board. Um, and I, in, especially, I think, in, in these different areas, but just as a protocol, when people come, Sometimes we intervene and we say, oh, we want to report, and sometimes we don't. But I, I have been making the assumption that that these issues are, are known to you or not, and that you get involved and then update us. And I think that's particularly important on these particular types of issues, particularly relative to the behavioral health system and our pharmacy. Does, so is there an automatic way that you do do that work when people come to speak? There, there isn't an automatic system for response. Um, many of the issues that are raised are often items that are in active discussion with our um, labor partners. And so there are conversations that are happening through those official channels. Um, not every item, but many of the items that, that come forward are uh, part of active conversation in that venue between uh, the county administration and um, the relevant department, their stewards, and so forth. And I was just going to add that um, where in the instances where items come up that aren't on our radar, generally in real time, um, James or I may be reaching out to the relevant department head or to labor relations to make sure that we can get some additional background on that and, and then respond to staff um, as appropriate if there are not already conversations ongoing. And so um, we'd be happy to follow up and give a little bit more information on a couple of so issues that were here, raised So here's what I want to just request is that um, for today, we heard about pharmacy, behavioral health, and the call center and TSS. And I, I think the TSS item is a, a different kind of item because I think the creating opportunities for career ladders is something I know you all are thinking about. And so I, I would, on all three items, like to request um, an off agenda that goes to the board just to explain both what the issue is and how it's being addressed. And I would like to also recommend that there there is a formal process by which we're not picking and choosing what we're responding to, but that, it's, that we're responding so that it doesn't require one of us to say, 
to quote Joe. What about this? What about that? Or on the one hand or on the other hand? Joe? Well, maybe I can be a little uh, more <coughs> uh, focused. Um, I, is it is, I, I support the concern that Supervisor Chavez is referencing, which is I do think it's important to the board, to the organization, and to the people who come that there be clarity about the fact that their concerns just don't go off into the ether, which is not the case. I know that because I have often worked with you all on these issues. Is it as simple as having um, at least one board member lean forward at the end of public comment when appropriate and say, look forward to a report back on items raised during today's public comment, period? Any one of us could say that presumably at the end of public comment. And not every report back has to be a PhD thesis or even a term paper or even a book report. Sometimes it'll be a paragraph, a sentence. Happy to let you know this issue was satisfactorily resolved to the benefit of all parties. Or it could be longer. Uh, let me look through the chair, if I may, to the county executive and his team and the county council as well. Is that the best way to? Uh, or is there some other way? Because I share the concern that we find a way to underscore the fact that people got heard and that people were responsive in whatever the appropriate measure might be. I, I think that is a great way to handle it. So you want us to, at the end of each public comment, ask for, for a response back from staff? I think that'd be helpful because it's not always clear. I mean, sometimes it's very clear. But other times it's not always clear that uh, a comment that may happen to be made by someone who, who may be an employee uh, is of the nature that it necessarily falls into Requires that category. Uh -huh. Some things clearly do, some things are in gray area, some things I would think probably don't at all. So. Okay. So I would ask then for today um, to practice, even though it was after a public comment, but during your report, um, that we get a response back relative to the the children's pharmacy issue, the behavioral health call center, and the TSS restructure. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Not seeing uh, additional lights, I'm going to move to item 15, which is a resolution for a roadmap to 2030 carbon neutrality. Move approval. Second. Are you interested in any presentation? Absolutely. All right. That was quick, <laughs> before they even sit down. <laughs> Good morning, Supervisor Sylvia Gallegos, Deputy County Executive. And I have to my right, Jasmine Sharma, who's our Director of Sustainability. And behind us, we have Jeff Draper, our Director of Facilities and Fleet, David Berry, who's the Chief of Facilities Planning, and Gillian Corral, who's a program manager in sustainability. And on Zoom, we have additional subject matter experts, including David Worthington, who's our director of fleet, uh, Greg Beverlin, who's a TDM planner, and also Brad Vance, who's our utilities programs analyst. Before uh, Ms. Sharma presents our 2030 roadmap to carbon neutrality, I wanted to make um, a few points. First, um, I wanted to uh, share with you that this isn't a new plan. This is actually advancing our previous target of 2045. And, and in Ms. Sharma's presentation, you'll hear why you know, we have increasing uh, anxiety around needing to accelerate our work. Um, it's a big, audacious plan. And when I first asked Ms. Sharma to develop it, you know, her eyes widened, but the Great thing about working for this organization and frankly working for this board is you're not afraid of big audacious plans. Importantly, we have a team of subject matter experts that are absolutely capable of performing this work and they have a proven track record as set forth in the resolution. And one I'd like to call out, and you'll recall this in 2019, we successfully transitioned the entire county oper operations to renewable electricity. And that was a really extraordinary achievement. Um, the second point I want to make is, unlike other plans I've reviewed by other jurisdictions that are notional or aspirational, this plan is concrete and asks for very specific investments that will have measurable outcomes. And we did a lot of foundational studies to, in order to be at this point. And then lastly, I think I would be remiss by not acknowledging 
that um, we have a plan, and you'll see it in the fiscal implications, that's partially funded, other things aren't funded. We do have a plan to engage consultants who are specific subject matter experts in seeking sort of sustainability grants, and there are many both at the federal and state level, in particular with the Inflation Reduction Act. But I want to call out, it isn't fully funded, and you heard the discussion, obviously, before when you were discussing veterans. There are many competing needs, and later on you'll hear from the county executive and our budget director that we are heading into very substantial budgetary headwinds. And so I say that, you know, it's incalculable the support that we're receiving from the county exec. He fully endorses the plan, and it is he who advanced the idea of a possible green geo bond measure. And I'm sure he'd be happy to discuss this at the end of the presentation, but I want to sort of lay all of that out there, these three main points. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to Ms. Sharma to begin the presentation. Thank you, Sylvia. Good afternoon, Board of, or good morning, Board of Supervisors. Again, I'm Jusneet Sharma, Director for the Office of Sustainability at the County. And as Sylvia mentioned, we do have several team members um, on board as well to answer or provide additional information at the end of the presentation. Um, next slide. Thank you. So um, I'm not sharing anything new with all of you or anyone in this room when I say that the climate is changing. I think what's really concerning is that the pace at which it's happening now, it's definitely happening way faster than we all had predicted as well. Um, just looking past or looking back at the last few years, we all remember multiple wildfires, record-breaking wildfires, the orange skies that we woke up to. We've now seen multiple heat waves. We've seen multiple atmospheric rivers as well, so much so that we also saw July, which was recorded as the hottest month so far, and then a recent hurricane in LA, which has not been seen before, and also the fact that the, they broke the record for the amount of rainfall that was received in one day. So I just, uh, again, not trying to paint a doom and gloom picture, but I think things are just happening faster than anticipated. Um, the good news is, or the hopeful news is, we do have a window of opportunity to really take action now to make sure that the global warming temperature sticks to about 1.5 uh, degrees as is called out for. Um, and the county is really well positioned to be that leader to take aggressive actions, both for its own operations, but also really to create momentum at both the local and state level for other organizations and jurisdictions to follow as well. So in the next few slides, I'll just go over some of the key sectors that are included in the roadmap as well. Um, starting with the building sector, as Sylvia mentioned, we are now because the buildings are powered by renewable energy, so natural gas use is the primary source of emissions in the building sector. When we did a building electrification study, we found that there are about 13 county buildings that account for 90% of natural gas usage in our uh, building portfolio. So if you, what that means is like really trying to focus on those 13 buildings, could get us where we need to be. Uh, the VMC, uh, the medical center, accounts for about 39% of emissions, and the fuel cells make up about 18% of the emissions. So electrifying the VMC chiller and then moving fuel cells to biogas actually gets us beyond that objective that you see on this slide about eliminating 50% of natural gas use from our buildings as well. Um, and another action I want to highlight is uh, starting to think through how we start to work on those other 12 buildings that, I, that would be left over. So about 82% of the HVACs in, these, in our county buildings are due for replacement by 2030. So that's an opportunity. If we can start some studies to both assess electrical capacity, but also what system adaptations are needed, we will be ready to replace those systems when the system fails or additional opportunities come up. Next slide. So this uh, slide just calls out the current state of funding for some of these actions that we mentioned. The work on the Valley Medical Center design and submetering study is currently, the scope of work for that work is currently underway and that project is funded. 
but as Sylvia mentioned, some of these other ones are not, and those are the things we will be looking at in the future as well. Next slide. So moving to commute programs uh, or employee commute, this does represent the single largest source of greenhouse gas emissions at about nearly 60%. Um, and then emissions from employee commutes, we hope to reduce them by as much as 74%. Um, we already have about, as of the most recent quarter, we have about 28% of employees that telework, about for an average of 2.2 days uh, per week. And it leads to about a 9% reduction in our overall emissions. For the most uh, recent commute survey that was done, we found out that about 10% of employees currently own EVs, and about 50% of the respondents said they do intend to buy one in the future. And I do think that some of the leadership that the state is showing in EV adoption, especially some of the rules that have been passed by the governor, that this timeline will likely be sped up on our employees adopting or buying new EVs as well. Again, an opportunity, but it also means we need to assess EV charging needs for our employees and making sure how do we meet their needs within our existing infrastructure and also future infrastructure that we'll be adding for county fleets too. And uh, lastly, I wanted to speak to transit subsidies as well is we can reduce our transit our emissions from the transportation sector by as much as 10 to 15% by giving transit subsidies. Uh, the main point to uh, call out for transit subsidies is that it is a participation-based program, so it only costs the county the amount of, based on the number of employees that actually use the subsidy to board a bus or a train. Uh, next slide, please. So we do include the funding amount for the transit subsidy program. This is based on a best case scenario of about 2,500 employees actually participating in the program. Next slide. Moving on to fleet electrification, uh, the objectives that you're seeing here to install 1,000 uh, level two and DC fast chargers and then also replace 75% of our light duty fleet vehicles is really has been developed to align with the advanced clean fleet rules that the California Air Resources Board passed earlier this year. Uh, the rule mandates that 50% of new trucks purchased by local government uh, need to be zero emissions between 2024 and 26. And then starting 2027, 100% of those trucks need to be zero emission. So currently about 21% of county on-road fleet is comprised of electric zero emission or near zero emission vehicles. Um, we did a little analysis and the total number of light duty vehicles that are forecast to meet target replacement criteria from now to 2030 is about 1,200 vehicles, which is above that 75% uh, objective that we placed on this slide. Uh, next slide. Um, currently, none of these items for fleet electrification are funded. Uh, and again, in order to reduce the cost to the county, we will be looking at numerous grants that are available, both from federal and state governments, but also from public utilities. Just as an example, um, FAF is in the process of signing a grant agreement with PG&E for installing 46 DC fast charging ports at 10 locations across the county. And that funding will also be made available to actually procure medium and light duty vehicles. Uh, this will save the county as much as two million because PG&E is really covering all the costs for the electrical upgrades. Next slide. Solid waste, so this is the fourth sector that I'm going to speak to. Uh, the objectives that are listed here and then the SB 1383 state mandate related to waste recycling and surplus food recovery. These have already been included in the uh, agreement with green waste recovery that the board actually approved at the last meeting. Um, and this agreement is funded um, in FAF's budget. Next slide. And lastly, even though the county has laid out an ambitious roadmap to shrink, uh, to shrink emissions in each sector, 
we do recognize that due to various factors, we won't be able to reduce all emissions. So to offset some of these emissions, we will need to rely on things like carbon sequestration and carbon offsets as well. The county has over 50,000 acres of parkland that can provide an opportunity for carbon sequestration. So this presents again an opportunity for the county to be a national leader in this area, which is still a relatively new practice in climate action planning. We're already in the process of finalizing the scope to conduct a carbon sequestration study with the Parks Department. Next slide. So just in summary, we've tried to include in this table the key actions across all the five sectors that I just went over. And then you'd also see the one time or the reoccurring costs for each of those actions, along with the overall emission reductions across uh, all of these actions. Again, we do intend to take a phased approach to implement these actions, which will also be dependent on funding availability and also available technology over the next eight years. Um, I do wanna draw your attention maybe to the last column. So if we did everything that's outlined in this table, we will reduce our operational emissions by 81%. And with that, we conclude our presentation and are available to answer any questions. Thank, Thank you very you so much. much. With, oh, oh, concluding, yes, you are ready. <laughs> what I'd like to do uh, with the consent of my colleagues is go first to the public for comment and then back to us for discussion. Thank you. Rhonda, do we have public speakers on this item? I have no in-person speakers, but I do have two online speakers. Do you want to speak before? Okay. Speakers? Uh, let's hear from the public speakers after I um, make the announcement that the queue for speaking on this item will close when the first speaker begins speaking. So if there is anyone on the Zoom that wishes to speak on this item, now is the moment to raise your virtual hand. Let's give that a couple of seconds, please. All right, it does look like we're holding it too. All right, let's hear our speakers, please. Our first speaker is Paul Soto. Paul, I've asked you to unmute. Please accept the unmute. You'll have two minutes to speak. Uh, yes, thank you, Paul Soto from the Horseshoe. I'd like to, to the goals are lofty. I understand the, the, the direction that society is going is going to be electrical. However, we do need to assume a certain amount of responsibility for that. And what I mean by that is that in, you need batteries. You are going to need batteries, period. This is not a, this is not a debatable issue. These are just facts that I'm giving to you. We're gonna need nickel, cobalt, and lithium. Now those are three main ingredients. Now the mining that is going to have to, uh, the mining that is gonna have to be done in certain South American countries, because those are the largest deposits of those three minerals in order to build those batteries. So we have to assume that wars are gonna be started in these other countries in order to commandeer and control those resources to build this, this utopian electrical society that you're talking about right here. So you have to assume the responsibility for that. So when you start hearing wars in South America, you start hearing about wars in Central America, don't act surprised. They're all in order to facilitate this electrical economy that you are generating here. So that's number one. Number two is that the poor is being exploited and this is how it's being done. You guys are using grant, you guys are applying for grant applications to install these electrical uh, grids in certain parts of the barrios and you're using the poverty that the people experience in that barrio in order to do it. It's sickening, it's disgusting and I'm not gonna tolerate it anymore, and why people are sitting on this council with a straight face, acting like that that's not happening, you're part of the problem, you're not part of the solution. So I'm expecting some advocacy and stop exploiting the poverty in our barrios in order to support your grant allocations to electrify the system, thank you. Thank you, our next speaker is Dashiell Leeds. I've asked you to unmute, please accept the unmute. Hello, uh, my name is Dashiell Leeds. I'm the conservation coordinator for the Sierra Club Loma Prieta chapter. 
Uh, we're supportive of the roadmap to 2030 carbon neutrality for county operations. We do hope you adopt it today uh, with one small but important modification. Uh, first, I'd just like to personally apologize to staff for bringing this change up at this point in the process. I really wish I had noticed this uh, potential change in March and would have loved to bring it up to you then, uh, but here we are today. Um, so the roadmap currently calls for the procurement of biogas for existing fuel cells. Uh, most fuel cells run all the time, 24-7, not just during power outages. Um, they're so costly that they only make sense economically if you use them for base load power, 24-7. Um, this makes them much higher in emissions than other power sources, and they also circumvent Silicon Valley Clean Energy, our community energy choice provider. Um, so SBCE loses important revenue when big customers use gas fuel cells. Uh, the Natural Resources Defense Council ran the numbers for fuel cells like bloom boxes in 2022 uh, and found that in order to cancel out the additional emissions produced by a single megawatt energy cell system, 1,261 single family homes would need to be electrified. Uh, and that's compared to the PG&E baseload power, uh, not even Silicon Valley clean energy. Um, so gas is gas, it produces significant emissions. Um, so here's the, the edit we do hope you include uh, in your motion today. Um, so in phase one, there's an action titled purchase biogas for existing fuel cells. Uh, the item currently calls for exploring market options to determine uh, the availability and validate cost information. And we hope you motion to add the following language to this action. Uh, quote, identify opportunities to transition away from gas fuel cell generators, end quote. Um, the county should be exploring options to transition away from fuel cells, uh, something that's not explicitly called out for in the plan right now. Um, so as you present this data on purchasing gas, please also explore options to transition away from it. Thank you. And that concludes our public speakers. Thank you. I'll go first to County, uh, county Executive James Williams. Thank you. I just wanted to take a quick uh, minute to first thank Jasneet and her staff and Jeff Draper and the FAF staff, as well as Deputy County Executive Sylvia Gallegos. A lot of work has gone into this plan, and I wanted to highlight a comment um, that uh, Sylvia alluded to me likely making at the end of the presentation, which is, as the board will see, this is a tangible plan. This is obviously an extraordinary planetary crisis. Uh, and for Santa Clara County to do its piece, small though it may be, is important. Um, the, the, the plan has some very significant needed capital investments in order to actually get where we need to go. Um, and uh, there isn't current identified funding to achieve those capital investments. And so you'll see in the report specific reference to uh, potentially inclu including those in a possible future general obligation bond that the county might bring. And I just wanted to highlight that for the board's attention. We've started some conversations related to that at FGOC. Um, and I think this could be one category of a few, especially depending on what may happen with the measure that the legislature has put on the March ballot uh, with respect to um, general obligation bonds and the, the lowering the threshold for voter approval down to 55% for certain categories uh, of expenditures and uh, climate resiliency infrastructure, um, I think would fit uh, within some of those categories. So wanted to highlight that for the board's attention. It's a tangible plan, it's a real plan, but that is a significant investment gap uh, that uh, we'll need to collectively tackle. Thank you. Thank you. Supervisor uh, Lee, then uh, Smidian. <clears throat> Thank you, um, uh, Supervisor Ellenberg. First, I would like to ask to make a motion if uh, uh, he would be amenable to um, also include the comment uh, made by one of the speaker uh, during public comment uh, regarding the issue for on the purchase of biogas for existing fuel cells and VMC chiller electrification project to also include uh, adding the language of also to uh, in addition, explore uh, potential market, uh, uh, other, uh, to identify other market opportunity uh, instead of using gas fuel generators. Through the chair, if I may, I think what I'd like to do is ask staff, it occurred to me that one possibility rather than <coughs> addressing the issue on the fly is that we might um, amend the motion supervisor to uh, approve the staff recommendation, which is to adopt the resolution, uh, but with specific direction to come back to the board 
possibly if the chair is amenable to, uh, to and through Hewlett um, uh, as to how you'd like to proceed on that item rather than take language over the Zoom today and incorporate it. Would that allow you to move forward with the approval of the plan but with an, essentially a carve out for that item so that we could have a more fulsome discussion about the issues that were raised in the comment? If I may, through the chair, um, I do have a quick response I can give on the fly, <laughs> it's, if it's okay. Um, we, we do, I just wanted to mention that we are halfway through a 20-year contract for the fuel cells, and at this point, if we were to terminate that contract or that agreement, it would cost the county about 20 million in liquidated charges, so that's one element. Um, secondly, using biogas would render them zero emission, and we're happy to provide more information on that. Um, thirdly, we do think fuel cells are also an important aspect for microgrids, just because solar can be pretty intermittent at times, and the fuel cells really do provide us that reliable base load source of energy that we need for our operations. So. Then I think what I'd like to do is leave the motion on the floor, supervisorly as it is, but with further direction, if the you as the seconder are amenable, further direction to staff to bring the fuel cell issue to and through the chair, if the chair is amenable, uh, <coughs> to uh, housing, land use, environment, and transportation. I don't want the issue to get lost, um, but I also don't want to get in the way of the um, forward progress because I take the point about timeliness, which I'll speak to in a minute. So it is truly an on the one hand, on the other hand moment. Uh, and um, if you're agreeable, Supervisor Lee, we'll leave the motion as it stands, but I, with I, further you, direction. Yeah, to I think send it whether it's uh, Hewlett or want to come to FGLC, we'll be happy to take on that as Why well. Why don't we send it to both if there's interest in both committees and if the committees are amenable? I can't Thank speak you. for the chairs, obviously. Great. Thank you. Are there additional comments? Yes. yes. Oh, <laughs> please. Sure. Uh, the, first of all, thank you for this uh, great report. This is truly exciting that our county is certainly making some big, uh, very forward-looking and uh, progressive steps on getting to this uh, zero emission issue. Um, first of all, I, I did see uh, on the building, uh, the table didn't talk about it, but on the uh, narrative, it talks about us uh, installing more solar panels. Uh, is that still part of the plan that we will have more solar panels being installed uh, in part, as part of the plan? Absolutely, and I know funding's also been approved for that, so those plans are still underway. Wonderful. Uh, and also, the second part, of course, is the storage, uh, electrical storage of the batteries. Um, those are still fairly expensive, but as we know, the battery is absolutely necessary. Uh, so want to see uh, how, how much of those type of capacity of batteries are we talking about for our county at this point? Mm -hmm. Supervisor, I'd like to actually request Brad Wands to respond to that question. Sure. absolutely. Hi, uh, Brad Vance, Utility Program Analyst. Um, with regards to energy Could you speak storage, up just a little bit, please? Your sound's a little muffled. Okay, I'll try to speak louder. With regard to energy storage systems, we currently have five projects in uh, pre-construction, and, and that comes from our REAP uh, Renewable Energy Project that was approved in 2019. Um, with regards to decarbonization, though, energy storage really wouldn't have an impact since it's um, storing and releasing electricity, um, you know, as a building needs it and to reduce the building's utility cost. But it's not really going to affect the emissions of that building. Yeah, so the, the purpose of those batteries, I think, is twofold. Uh, one of which, as we know, is that we use the battery, if we use the energy during the uh, after hours, uh, obviously there will be no more sun, right? And that's why the batteries is helpful to kick in to provide the uh, energy. So, for example, like the car I drive right now every to work, uh, I'm telling people I'm driving the energy generated from my house's roof yesterday because it charged up the battery during the day, right? And then when I go home and charge at night, that's how my car got charged up. So in that sense, I am zero uh, emissions in the sense that the, the 
energy being generated is not from a PG&E or even SCCE. We actually generate from our own home. That's going to the battery that I'm driving. So I think that's great, number one. Second thing about the, the importance of having um, um, cars and batteries we talk, keep talking about is that let's not forget about the vehicles we are buying as well because when we buy the vehicles, those, ve those electrical vehicles also have a battery. And because of the fact that the vehicle battery can provide reverse charging, we could actually use the fleet of our EVs parking in our parking lot to charge up a building, especially in time of emergency. So because of the emergency part, we all talk about having um, uh, maybe some type of uh, uh, potentially gas uh, generator, that, which, which is popular. Uh, that in itself, the electrical part from the cars is also another way of getting reverse charging, um, uh, providing that extra uh, security for us. Uh, we've done that when I was way back in Sunnyvale 15 years ago. We installed a lot of these solar panels and batteries for that very purpose. And I, I'm hoping to make sure that our county, of course, will be adopting this uh, similar idea. This is nothing new. This is not the Jetsons. This is actually today. We we already have it. Um, and, and then the other thing I also mentioned is uh, we didn't talk much about the lower maintenance cost of our fleet, the vehicles, because electrical vehicles do not need oil change. To a lot of people, that's a surprise uh, because there is no motor to, to lubricate. There is no transmission in an electrical car. And because of that, the maintenance cost is actually significantly lower by having electrical vehicles. So uh, I just want to also add that as another benefit that when we say green, it's not just for environment. Green could also save money as well. So thank you very much. Supervisor Chavez, then Smilian. Thank you. Um, I, I want to just say how much I appreciated the report. And to be perfectly candid with you, um, often when we get reports like this, one of my frustrations is there's very little analysis in them and a lot of data. And this was very well done. Um, just a couple of things that I want to make sure, very big picture, that I understand. And one of them is, um, as, as, the, as the report lays out, um, addressing carbon neutrality for county operations, when, when the definition of county operations was being um, considered, that, that is um, us wearing our hats as an as a organization, business, or entity. Yes? Yes. And, um, and part of the reason I was curious about that is that the, you know, some of what I, I, I've been concerned about is how we, we can do our best relative to how we address carbon. And we have a big fire, and it sort of erases all of the mm -hmm. good work that we've been doing. Mm -hmm. And so one, one question I have is, as you think about uh, operations, um, and I know you have lots of other plans. I mm -hmm. think the plans are really robust. Is the prevention of, um, of fires, is that in another plan? For the, for the county in terms of how we're addressing mm -hmm. climate change? Um, I think, Supervisor, some of that would be addressed through the carbon sequestration study, because that's an aspect of it is, of course, how you're storing carbon and how you're drawing down more of that. So right. some of the uh, practices that we would apply on our county parks for vegetation management, uh, forest management, that would be part of that analysis. Uh, you're speaking to, of course, something that's, of course, beyond our operations as well, which some of it was going to get addressed through the Community Climate Action Plan as well. Um, and I'm not sure I, I concur that this is completely out of our um, opportunity to, to, to um, intervene. And what I'm really speaking about are emerging technologies that give us more and more opportunity to get fires, to, to deal with prevention faster. And um, and I apologize if it was in here and I missed it, but if it's not here, then mm -hmm. then where is it? Well, if, if yeah. uh, I may add, uh, you know, there is a wildfire prevention plan and yeah. County Fire has brought that item forward separately, but I well, think... Well, to be honest with you, we didn't, we didn't prioritize. In, in fact, I know I, I brought one of the first request to us in before even COVID because we were seeing such extreme behavior by fires and we we didn't really have an investment strategy plan there as I see one that really that looks here at 
here's what we have funded. And mm -hmm. there they just said, here's what our needs are. And we said, oh, thank you for that. So I'm, I'm really just trying to understand the, the connection and the interplay between them and whether or not what, we'll, what we will eventually see is what are the areas that really require um, a higher level of, of um, intervention and, and perhaps even, on the, even more on the prevention side. So I don't know if that's coming back as part of mid-year budget, um, James, or? I'm not aware of the current status of that plan. I was just noting that that was a separate product prepared by a separate entity. And I'm yeah, and I and I'm interested in linking them. And so if if what you're saying is that 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 goes in that other bucket, fine. We just I would just want to understand how to better link them together, especially as it relates to um, opportunities for and and need for investment. Because uh, to go back to the conversation we were having earlier about where you would prioritize those items, for me, um, you know, I served on the air board on behalf of the county for. Um, maybe eight years, and I remember us being so excited about where we were going with our clean air, and, and then as soon as the wildfires hit, it you look at the overall investment that a lot of agencies made, and all of that was just gone. And when I was looking at the impacts, um, at, and I can't remember what part of the, the um, presentation, but um, I, I was thinking a little bit about the you know, just the impacts both of fire and heat, even to the healthcare system. And I was really thinking even more about the fires because of asthma and all of that. But if, if I, I hear what you're saying, if, that, if the interplay is really there, what I would just ask is that as reports come back to our progress, I think we have to link the prevention work in even to this side of the aisle. Otherwise, I think we're not getting a clear picture of how our investments are or are not going to have impact overall on our, our body of work. And then the second point I wanted to raise was really more for the administration, um, and that is that I, I, I really recognize that there's going to be so much new technology that will be coming on board, and I hadn't really thought about this till Jesney, till you responded to that question about our 20-year commitment to this one particular partnership, and it made me interested in how the county, um, I'd like how, how we make investments or what's our strategy for making investments that recognizes that we have to deal with, you know, amortization of investment and yet create enough flexibility to be responsive because we see so many new technologies zooming up so quickly. I think this is particularly true in battery storage, but there are probably other areas, you know, even carbon sequestration, pavement, you know, um, new treatments for pavement management and all that. So I don't know if that's something you've all already given thought to as it relates to procurement strategies that give us flexibility to respond to emerging opportunities. Supervisor, those are all excellent points. We don't have a plan per se now, but we'll take that back and report back later. And that might just require us to engage procurement. Um, and then thank you. I, I apologize. I did say two things. I'm going to add a third. I apologize for this. And that is that I'm really, I feel like um, I really appreciated the, the President Obama's statement. That's really profound and very, in some ways, hopeful, given where we are um, with, you know, in terms of fighting climate change. And and as I was thinking about it, I was thinking about how important it's going to be for us to continue to build in redundancy because of the fact that we are an emergency entity and our ability to respond is going to require us to have different types of, of um, um, technologies, even some that are older, still available to us so we can respond to emergencies. And I, I say that re recognizing that we want to move full steam ahead to clean energy and yet need to make sure that we have access to, you know, um, diesel and uh, gasoline and other, other um, types of energy so that we can respond to whatever emergency comes our way. And so, I, again, I would just say that I think um, wherever you think it's appropriate, really having a deeper dive into how we build in redundancy in future presentations, I think would be helpful for all of us to be thinking about that, that role we play as a safety net entity. But thank you. It's really, really incredible work. Supervisor Smidian. Well, uh, thank you to uh, all who were part of putting the 
report together and the roadmap together. Um, Ms. Gallegos, Ms. Sharma, Mr. Draper, et al. Um, as um, you may know and as my colleagues are certainly aware, um, I have an occasional inclination to tell a story from back in the day, which I will resist today, which I will resist today because what I want to underscore is that, um, and, and this is obviously a broad sort of philosophical observation, but I, I want it to sort of be part of the record and I want staff to understand this is what motivated me to lean in on this item. Politics and government is or should be not about yesterday, but about tomorrow and the day after and the day after that. Politics and government, in my view, should be about the future. And this roadmap is about the future, which is why I think it is both important and exciting. So thank you for that. <clears throat> um, Ms. Sharma, I had to smile when you were describing the, smile darkly, but smile, when you were describing the uh, circumstances in which we find ourselves, uh, and you used the very technical term way faster uh, to describe uh, the way that the impacts are now being felt way faster than we all predicted. And that's why I think um, having some sense of urgency about this work um, is important. And urgency about this work because, as you said in your opening statements, these are very tangible, concrete, um, pieces of work that are going to be necessary if we're going to get to the place we want to be tomorrow, the day after, and the day after that. Now, it, and there was a hint of this, I think, in some of your remarks, it would be easy for someone to say, and some have essentially said it, look, why would one city, one town, one county, even a large county, take this work on given the global nature of the work? And um, I, I think the, the simple answer is that people can't follow our lead if we don't lead, you know? So let's lead. Uh, and, uh, and I'm willing to be humble enough on behalf of our county to say let's follow where others have led. Uh, but, uh, yes, there will be costs, uh, and the county executive is, in my view, right to remind us of the fact that there are costs, and some of those costs have not yet, uh, do not yet have identified funding sources, but, um, you know, we can't get where we want if we don't know where we want to go. This is a roadmap that says this is where we want to go, and then we need to be about the business of uh, getting ourselves there. So the fact that it is relatively long term in terms of you know the next seven years um, means that there will be work to do, there will be funds to find, uh, but I hope that people will understand the urgency of that given the fact, as Ms. Sharma reminded us, that all of this is happening way faster, uh, again, to use the new term of art that I'll be adopting. Um, I will, Okay, so I'm gonna break my promise here. I will uh, share this observation about back in the day. Um, I heard that there was no rush, no urgency in 2006 when I co-authored the Global Warming Solutions Act of 2006 here in California with the lead author, then uh, Assembly Member Fran Pavley. And I, honest to God, remember sitting in um, the governor's smoking tent, Governor Schwarzenegger, who saw no irony at all in talking about air quality in the smoking tent uh, as the cigar smoke billowed uh, forth. And I remember him, you know, somewhat pointedly in a, a professional way, uh, asking, well, you know, we're just one state. Um, and why, you know, why can we, um, why should we take on this responsibility? And I had the same observation then that I shared with you today, which is, you know, if we don't lead, others can't follow, and there are 200 sovereign nations in the planet, and, uh, you know, if we are one of the world's largest emitter of greenhouse gases, which California is, or at least uh, was, um, then we can't expect others to follow. So I hope that will be the view 
Um, and the last thing I will say is there are going to be people, Ms. Sharma and team, who tell you that it can't be done. And they are wrong. Uh, it can be done. It has to be done, more to the point. Uh, I remember when we were pushing, my predecessor Byron Schur, now I'm really breaking my promise, my predecessor Byron Schur in 2002 um, led with landmark legislation on uh, renewable energy and people said it couldn't be done and they were wrong and then we pushed to accelerate that. Uh, I picked up the torch from Byron and we pushed to accelerate renewables to 20% by 2010. People said, oh, we can never get there. They were wrong. We did. We have. That's in the rearview mirror. Similarly, when we said 33 percent by 2020, which was my next contribution to the effort, people said, oh, that's impossible. And again, they were wrong. We're, we're now looking over our shoulder at that saying, where do we go next? And your plan, uh, the roadmap, our plan, uh, once I stop talking and we get hopefully five votes, uh, our roadmap is the, the answer to the question, where do we go next? So. I'm, I'm sort of leaving that behind as an exhortation to the organization um, not, to, not to succumb to the temptation to say, well, why should we do it? We're just one county, or to say it can't be done. We have to lead if others are going to follow, and it can be done, it has been done, and, and you know, it will be done if we have the political will to do it. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you for your work. Supervisor Arenas. Thank you. Um, I'm going to just follow up on an item that I mentioned during um, Hewlett, uh, the committee, and, and that was about uh, the unleaded fuel um, from the county airports, and I know that this is part of the scope three emissions, and that you were going to, in the future, um, somehow inventory that impact. Um, and I'm wondering if if your focus is only going to be on, on um, scope one and two emis emissions and how we're going to include the, the airports in future inventories. Um, so by the way, we are starting some work with the healthcare system on looking at scope three emissions as a little pilot for us to start to edge into what scope three means for our emissions as well. So this, you're right, is primarily focused on scope one and scope two. There are very clear um, guidelines and criteria how you measure that. I think scope three is still an emerging area as well. So there is some work to be done to understand that. Um, and then certainly uh, some of that work will also start to happen through the sustainable purchasing policy that we are working with the procurement department to implement. So it is, it is on our radar and it is on our mind. Thank you so much. I, I appreciate the, the hard work that um, has led you to this point. Um, I, I love that you're embracing and making sure um, uh, carbon neutrality and making sure that we as a county are also uh, part of a, a greater roadmap, uh, not only just for our county, but for, for our state of California. And so it's, it's work that's really important um, that will um, leave legacy. And so uh, I want to congratulate both of you for that um, and for making sure that we are continue to be leaders in, in these areas. Um, so thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you to all of my colleagues for conversation and, and to staff for the report, which, which really was um, impressive and inspiring, truly. Um, I would love to see us reach these goals. I, I'm just going to ask one question that I, I ask in, in so many places when we talk about all electrification. What kind of confidence do you have in PG&E to be able to support this anticipated significant um, additional load? And if your confidence isn't high, um, what are are our alternatives. I know that we, we are part of SVCE, but it's still the PG&E lines and hardware, and those prove to be problematic all too often. Yeah, so was I'd like to call on one of our staff persons to answer that, though I will kind of preface it by saying that there is some work to be done. I also know 
and have been hearing from, uh, of course, every other jurisdiction sure. who's worried about the same thing, like do we have the capacity, do we, you know, do we have the load that, the power that we need. Uh, pg and &E, I've heard, or I, I know some conversations are starting to happen on exploring some new models with them on how to both even fund some of this work to upgrade the capacity. So I think it might be time for us to enter those conversations as well and start this, but I was either gonna call on uh, Greg Beverlin uh, with the Facilities and Fleet Department to maybe answer that question, or if additionally Brad Vance has something to say, because they both work with pg &E, one from the building side, another from the uh, fleet electrification side. Great, thank you. Do you mean in real time on Zoom they're here or they are in here. the future? Okay. Yes, I'm hoping they're unmuting themselves. Uh, hi, this is Brad Vance, Utility Program Analyst. Um, electrical upgrades on PG&E's grid is going to be a real issue as more customers start to electrify their buildings. Um, you know, it's really a case-by-case -case basis. Um, for some buildings, it might be uh, less of an issue. In other cases, it might be very complicated. Um, you know, I know PG&E in the past has made comments that they do support electrification, which is interesting, um, but not unexpected as they kind of start to become more of a distribution and transportation uh, service versus an energy supply service. Um, with all that said, uh, you know, I think the best we can do is, is, is work with them uh, on these projects that are coming in the future. I, uh, I appreciate that, and I know there, there wasn't going to be a clear answer. I, I want to share that I have the opportunity to participate in monthly conversations with, with PG&E, and frankly, it's mostly rural counties that um, show up for these conversations. And if there are issues that you want me to raise or questions that, that maybe we can get answers to, please um, work with me. I'll ask David Fernandez to reach out to you to schedule some time before the next, uh, the next meeting. Thank that, you. Thank you. I don't see any further lights on. We have a motion by Simidian, a second by Chavez? Lee. By Lee, we've heard public comment. Uh, we've heard the excellent report and presentation. Let's vote. Supervisor Arenas? Yes. Supervisor Chavez? Yes. Supervisor Smedian? Vice President Lee? Aye. President Ellenberg? Yes. Motion carries. Great. Thank you. Let me uh, do some quick housekeeping items. We are going to break for 30 minutes from 1230 to 1 for lunch. We are, um, we have uh, quite a few meaty items left for discussion and we are losing two supervisors at 2 p.m and a third supervisor at three, which means that this meeting, um, regardless of where we are in the agenda, will come to an end at three. So what I would like to do is get a sense from my colleagues. Um, the ATI report can be heard no earlier than one, but doesn't necessarily have to be heard at one. Um, the county executive has expressed an interest in having all five of us here for the budget conversation. So I would like to recommend having that one um, first and seeing Nod. Um, I'm gonna ask that we follow our published agenda and take items 16 and 17 up next. Well, our published agenda might um, also argue for item eight to be heard next since it will be one o'clock when we come back. Respectfully, uh, our published agenda indicates that item eight will be heard no earlier. Than, right, right, right. Um, and uh, if there's a preference to continue item 17 to our next meeting, um, I would be comfortable with that, but I'm not comfortable either giving it short shrift since it is a criminal matter to fail to comply, mm -hmm. nor would I be comfortable um, being absent for that item since the item is back at uh, my urging and request. Makes sense, so I will look to Supervisors 
Chavez and Lee to see if you have a preference to hear it first after lunch w what or I would to... Just, I think it's fine to defer it and to the next meeting and that way we can give okay. it the time it deserves. Yeah. I think Perfect. That's a good point. Then we will defer those items. Those items meaning item 17, Madam Chair? Uh, items... Yeah, item 17. Uh, oh, yes, single item, item 17. Thank you. Do we need to take right. a motion or anything? Uh, do you want to make that a motion, Supervisor Chavez, Supervisor Simidian, to defer it to the next meeting? Happy to move that we continue item 17 to our next scheduled regular meeting. Second, Chavez. Thank you. Uh, uh, Rhonda, will you take a vote on that, please? Public hearing. Supervisor Reynas? Yes. Supervisor Chavez? Yes. Supervisor Lee? Aye. Sorry, I went out of order. Supervisor Simidian? Aye. <laughs> President Ellenberg. Yes. Police. All right, thank you. We will see everyone at 1 o'clock. Love that gavel, Susan. <laughs> it's a good release. It so does. I'm not whacking any of you.
Good afternoon. It is one o'clock and we are reconvening after a 30 minute lunch break and we have a new clerk. Hello. <laughs> Let's uh, begin with a roll call, please, to establish the continued presence of a quorum. And you're on today, right? <laughs> Your mic isn't on. There we go. Thank you, sound room. Supervisor Arenas. Here. Supervisor Chavez. Supervisor Simidian. Vice President Lee. And President Ellenberg. I am here we as We are reconvened. Well. Thank you. Um, we were having some calendaring conversations um, given some uh, time constraints today, which resulted in holding item 17. Uh, until the next meeting. So we're going to proceed with item eight, um, which was to be heard not before one o'clock. I understand there were folks anticipating it at one uh, and waiting to participate. So item eight is alternatives to incarceration work group report. And we will hear the presentation, then go to public comment, uh, and then come back to the board. Good afternoon, team. Good afternoon, Martha Wapensky, Deputy County Executive. This is a joint report on the inter Alternatives to Incarceration Implementation Plan. With me today are Deputy County Executives Casey Halcon and Key Lee and Program Manager Veronica Marcello. We do have a presentation today. Did I understand that you wanted to see the presentation or go straight to questions? Do my colleagues have a preference? I, th I think we should hear the presentation given the public interest. All right, we're getting the slides up now, but I'll go ahead and get started. Back in January of 2022, the board approved a referral related to this work. The, I'm not going to go too much over this slide, but there were three work groups established to work on this, on the alternatives to incarceration work. And each group included representatives from a variety of stakeholders that you see there on the slide. From a high level, the ATI work groups yielded eight recommendations and 37 potential strategies related to those recommendations. And the fi their final report was presented to the board on June 6th. Since that time, we've been reviewing the recommendations and we also had two in-person feedback sessions with the work group members in August and September, as you see there on the slide. The plan framework, which Deputy County Executive Keeley will go into on the next slide, is aligned in a way where it incorporates, um, the way we're doing it incorporates updates on regular reporting we already do to the board and the public on these topics. The, the recommendations are grouped into six overarching goals, as we'll see in a moment and each of those 37 recommendations and strategies are inside those goals. So with that, I will turn it over to Deputy County Executive Keeley. Uh, thank you, Martha. Um, as Martha indicated, we, the staff, went through the eight recommendations and 37 strategies um, from the ATI work groups. Uh, we identified some core themes and proposals through, um, throughout the work group recommendations. Um, we also noted that some recommendations and strategies cut across multiple intercept points. As you may recall, the work groups were focused on intercept zero, which is before engagement with law enforcement, um, uh, what happens when people are in custody and receiving services, and um, 
creating alternatives or plans for re-entry. And, and as we went through the recommendations, we found that some recommendations cut across those, uh, those points and could be perhaps organized uh, in a different way. For example, some of the recommendations really related to uh, increasing temporary shelter, permitted housing. Um, those have application, of course, both at intercept zero as people are um, being assisted by our mobile crisis teams. Um, they also have application for when people um, are re-entering our community from incarceration. Next slide, please. Um, we identified six goals from those themes and they're outlined here. Um, I will go through them briefly in the next few slides. Next slide, please. One major theme was for the county to uh, reduce unnecessary involvement with law enforcement agencies, uh, thus creating less opportunity uh, for possible incarceration or for their involvement with the justice system. Uh, the board is aware that this has been a significant uh, initiative or effort that the county is undertaking. Um, some of the major initiatives include the psychiatric emergency response teams, uh, the trust teams, um, as well as expanding 988. Uh, next slide, please. Um, uh, this is a continuation of the first goal, and our recommendation is that we would continue to uh, report on the progress of these strategies uh, through our public health crisis reports and through our health and hospital committee. Next slide, please. Um, the next slide, the, the next theme was to ensure that uh, we had effective coordination and services for everyone who is coming through the justice system. Um, the county has made significant uh, investments in increasing uh, services through our custody health department, our diversion and reentry services uh, office, our behavioral health department, um, and uh, we also recognize, though, that we still do not have um, a, a, uh, the ability to assess the reentry needs and to develop reentry plans for everyone who comes through the jail, um, whether they're booked and uh, uh, stay at the jail for 24 or 48 hours, or whether they are sentenced and are staying in the jail for quite some time. So the primary intent here is to create a function a, a team within the county that is able to help us get a more comprehensive uh, set of assessments, a more iterative assessments, and then to coordinate uh, this discharge plans and implement those plans across the different county departments. Uh, next slide, please. Um, th that will manifest in several ways. One is, is a team or department that is primarily responsible for that, but it also manifests in, in uh, physical locations where we try to offer services. We have the reentry center, of course, but at, for example, Elmwood, uh, many people are leaving the jail at different times uh, and may not um, be able to receive or the offer of services. So we, uh, one idea is to uh, provide a team there that can catch people, offer services as they leave. Next slide, please. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you, Key. My name is Casey, uh, Deputy County Executive. So I'll be covering uh, this portion of goal two, which is to continue to explore opportunities to expand our diversion-oriented programs that are operated by the district attorney, the public defender, the court, and some of our justice partners. You'll notice on this slide that several are listed, um, many of which some of you are familiar with from various presentations to the Board of Supervisors, but also to the Public Safety and Justice Committee. And I think what's important to note is these are um, ever evolving and the relationships are becoming, and collaboration is becoming deeper as these teams get a little bit more time under their belt um, and work together um, in a more coordinated way. So an example, um, just to kind of preview for all of you, one of the programs that we're looking to develop out is between the camp team and the PAR team. So this is a collaboration between the district attorney's office and the public defender's office and the courts to be able to create a pre-plea court calendar for our clients who have more complicated mental health needs where some of the underlying criminogenic factors may be related to mental health and substance abuse disorder 
in order to identify uh, those clients more quickly within the system and also to hopefully get them the treatment and the services that they need more quickly so as to cut back on some of the additional time that they need to be in custody, but also to um, shorten the amount of time that the court is having to see these matters continually. So that is in development, um, and there is a multidisciplinary team that is meeting with the courts, and we should have a proposal um, for us to review shortly. So while these, some of these work obviously is noted on the slide, I think it's important to note that there is ongoing work, um, and we can report back on, on that um, in later iterations of the ATI work groups as needed. Um, an another theme that came through the ATI work groups was the need to continue to expand treatment services uh, for people with a serious mental illness and or a substance use disorder. Um, that has been a focus for the Behavioral Health Services Department and the county on an ongoing basis. Um, and there is uh, more work that needs to be done. For example, even though we have expanded our intensive outpatient programs for individuals with a serious mental illness um, from 1,600 to about 3,000 patients each year, um, there are still gaps in our system. Uh, for example, uh, while we have intensive outpatient programs for people with a serious mental illness, um, we do not have the equivalent of a full service partnership type program for individuals with a substance use disorder. So goal three is about expanding those existing programs, but also creating new programs to meet uh, unmet needs. Uh, next slide, please. Um, goal four is related to three, but a little bit broader. Um, we acknowledge that temporary treatment facilities, temporary shelter, and permanent housing resources are essential to long-term recovery and successful re-entry. Um, we have significantly expanded programs for individuals with serious mental illness and substance use disorder and have significantly expanded shelter and permanent housing. Uh, the report lists all of the activities uh, that we have uh, implemented, how we've expanded programs, and opportunities to uh, further increase programs on an ongoing basis. Next slide, please. Um, whereas goal three was primarily focused on the needs of individuals with SM serious mental illness or substance use disorder, we recognize that um, many individuals uh, need not just treatment services or may not even need treatment services, but need other forms of support. Um, here we focus our energies around employment opportunities um, and identify some of the ways in which the D Office of Diversion Reentry Services has expanded those programs and opportunities to expand it in the future. Final slide. Um, and then uh, the, the last theme that we wanted to pull out from uh, the report was a, a need to really uh, make sure that the existing programs have the personnel uh, that is necessary to run those programs, but also to infuse those programs with uh, individuals with more lived experience. Um, and uh, similar to our work with the Behavioral Health Services Department, a major theme here is to make sure that we have uh, effective workforce development programs to meet all of our programmatic needs. Thank you. And I'll be rounding out this presentation by talking about the key themes from the ATI work groups. As I mentioned before, we had two sessions, uh, feedback sessions, on the six goals that Key Lee just talked about. The first one, actually, let me back up for a second. The, the four of us here um, were there at each of the work group sessions to listen to the feedback um, and reflect on that. This is what you see on the slide is just a sample of the diverse, rich, and deep discussion the work group members had um, on, the, on the plan moving forward. The, the details are in your packet, but as you can see on the slide, they're um, interested in reducing the jail population as we all are by minimizing criminal justice involvement and diverting individuals away. There's a focus on efforts uh, and funding for the root causes to reduce and avoid incarceration. There's the, they have the thoughts of including those with authority to implement the recommendations that are outside of the authority of the county. There was also discussion about prioritizing community voices and lived experience board for in, in the work moving forward. A key theme I also heard, we also heard throughout was the development of 
metrics to measure the progress on the goals, possibly data dashboard, key indicators of success, things like that. Um, another recurring theme was a need to break down the silos within the county um, and a need for a coordinator of all this work moving forward with clear timelines, roles, and responsibilities. And finally, as you see on the slide, there was optimism about goal five to expand programs and service at various intercept points that Key referred to earlier, and goal six on workforce development as well. So with that, we're going to um, go ahead and take questions. Thank you. I'm going to look first uh, to see if we have any public, any members of the public wishing to speak on this item. Yes, we do have three speakers in chambers and currently five, six, and seven in Zoom let me and growing. And growing. Let, let's then watch it grow for a minute so we can make a determination on uh, timing. It's holding at seven. Okay, and we have three in chambers, so at 10 minutes, at, at um, 10 speakers, we are still at two minutes, but I will let folks know on Zoom that if you raise your hand um, after we begin and we get more than 15 speakers, then I'm going to move the speaking time for remaining speakers to one minute. But let's begin. and. Uh, note as well to folks that are in chambers, if you're intending to speak, now is the time to have your yellow card in. The in-person queue will close when the first speaker begins speaking. And I'm just, let's just give it a second to see if anybody else is looking for yellow cards, and if not, nope, we're good. So let's uh, hear the three speakers in person, please. Our three speakers in chambers, Marshawn Kinsey, Avant, and Miss Ellen Rollins. Hello, thank you. My name is Marshawn Kinsey. I'm from Compton, California. I was giving the implementation plan for alternative incorporation from Miss Queen Mother Ellen Ross, Ellen Rollins, and I was just so excited about what you guys are doing and the implementation, guys. I want to give you guys a hand. I came all the way to Compton just to give you guys a hand on really accepting an opportunity for great change. I have read a lot of opportunities for reentry, and what you guys really want to do is really give second chances. I mean, the freedom that you really want to give to people is truly forgiveness. And I want to thank you guys for what you've done. I have submitted a plan to you guys because it has just inspired me to work in the efforts of what you're really trying to do to help these people. I have been working with gangs and people in prison for years, helping them create books, and just seeing what you guys are doing to help to mentally while they're in jail and preparing them out. Again, I want to give you one more standing ovation. Thank you guys so much. I have some information that I already sent to you guys, and I'm just hoping that we can do work together. Thank you and appreciate you guys for what you've done for us in the community. Thanks. I was fortunate to be at Ellen Rollins. I was fortunate to be at one of the workshops. Uh, sitting in for the chair of the criminal justice for the National Association of uh, the NAACP. And I was really pleased. This is old for me. Some of you may not know some of my history. I've taught inside jail. I've worked acute psych in the VA for 11 years. And my family has been impacted about as driving while black. And so this piece was important. The words in, in my energy with the, on the workshop was that I was very pleased that the language was still there. And we had to say whether we highly agreed or did we do agree, did not agree, was neutral, I couldn't say highly agree because the language is old for me. And what has not happened is what you're talking about today, the meat on the bone to make the programs happen, to make the opportunities for real change happen. Such as there used to be, when you get let out of jail 12 o'clock in the morning, there used to be a VTA bus that was at Elmwood, so that clients who had been in the summer were barefooted, Daisy Duke, some clothes on, 
It's winter time, but there was a boat, a bus, and they got a, a, a day pass so they could start the time off well. That's been removed. They can be put back. We need to really care and increase the opportunity for Thank you. recovery. Thank you. Thank you. There was a third card, Avant. Is Avant here? Doesn't look like they're in chamber still. All right. Has the um, number on Zoom changed? We are still holding at seven. Okay, I'll just make a last uh, last notice that if anyone is on Zoom and wishes to speak on this item, right now is the time to raise your virtual hand. The queue will close when the first speaker begins speaking. Okay, our first speaker in Zoom. We did have one more hand go up. Okay, Hold so give it, give it just a second okay. then. <laughs> okay, holding at eight? We are at eight. All right. Jose Val, please unmute. Uh, hello? Yes. Okay, sorry about that. I'm having trouble here with my phone. Uh, let me get this started. Um, hi, this is Jose with uh, Silicon Valley Debug. Uh, first and foremost, I'd like to thank Supervisors Ellenberg and Chavez for acknowledging our critique, plight, and struggle to have true alternatives to incarceration to implement actual policy changes to objectively reduce incarceration in Santa Clara County, County as proposed in Debug's PSJCATI recommendations proposal. Secondly, I would like to take, thank uh, Supervisor Lee for his efforts and proposals such as re-implementing zero-dollar bail and calendaring arrest warrants, as well as having community stakeholders sit down with policymakers to brainstorm bold policies necessary to reduce the jail population. The county executive's ATI workgroup recommendations lack data necessary to determine measurable goals to reduce the jail population, as well as the courage to raise policy changes needed to successfully do so. Many ATI work group members were ignored and pushed to the side, but today we have been heard. We are also calling on the board to deeply consider the concerns and asks of the ATI work group members' letter to the board administration, such as an oversight and consultant committee made up of ATI work group members and folks that are directly impacted to execute an implementation plan that includes policy change and to reconvene on that progress and make further recommendations as necessary. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker. The next speaker is Catherine Hedges. Please accept the unmute. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Catherine Hedges. I am a member of Showing Up for Racial Justice, and I'm here to support the ATI work group. And uh, I thank Supervisors Ellenberg and Chavez very much for their memorandum supporting the work group recommendations instead of the oversimplified implementation uh, otherwise recommended. And I strong, we strongly support the memo by Chavez and Ellenberg. And, um, yeah, and recommend that the board follow that directive. Thank you very much. Thank you. The next speaker, Paul Soto. Please accept the unmute. Uh, yes, Paul Soto from the Horseshoe. First of all, we as a community can congratulate ourselves in the sense that I was in the prison system four years prior to the poly class murder. Now, what the prosecutors in this county did, leveraging the power that was extracted from that heinous murder, from that heinous crime, and what they did with it, they completely erased and subjected an entire generation of men. I happen to be part of that generation of men. Now, we are moving away from that, and I congratulate you and anybody in the community that is participating in the process of implementing a policy that provides an alternative to prisons and jails. However, I do not know about these meetings. These meetings are held in secret, and I'm gonna call that out I'm gonna be expecting an email from somebody. I wanna be a part of these meetings. Nobody in Silicon Valley debug has spent over three decades inside that jail. I have, I have. 
Has anybody on those HEI, whatever it is that you, whatever acronym is being used, have they spent over three decades inside of those prisons and jails? Absolutely not. So the legitimacy of these policies are kind of, that's what I have a question about. Now, I'm asking that I be included in that, in those particular meetings, because when we're talking, we're not just talking about justice for the people currently. We're also providing a space for the people that experience that kind of oppression. And it was at the hands of the district attorney of this county. I experienced that. So I expect to be included in these conversations. And I will question the legitimacy of any findings that you present to the board if I'm not. Thank you. The next speaker, Kim, please accept the unmute. Yes, good afternoon. My name is Kim Guptill, and I'm a member of Surge at Sacred Heart and a D4 voter. We share the frustration of members of the ATI work groups who noted that the ATI implementation plan basically says, let's just keep doing what we're doing, and that the report proposes tweaks to incarceration rather than alternatives to incarceration. We additionally support their calls for transparency and metrics. And while we appreciate that the county allocated over $4 million last year to expand trust this year, it's not enough. The county needs to double the number of field teams, starting with San Jose, which generates many of the calls for service. Part of the work plan should be to identify additional sources of funding from the state and federal government for the program. We echo the voices of work group members who call for centering those with lived experience in decision-making processes. To that end, we ask that debugs practical and immediate strategies for reducing the county's jail population also be added to the work plan with a specific targeted reduction in jail population by a certain date. Thank you very much. Thank you. The next speaker is Sandra Asher. Please accept the unmute. Good afternoon. My name is Sandra Asher. I'm a member of the ATI work group, a disability rights advocate, and a District 5 voter. I appreciate the letter submitted by Board President Ellenberg and Supervisor Chavez. I urge the entire board to reject the proposal, the proposed ATI implementation plan as written. As discussed in the letter from the work group, the proposed plan is overly focused on behavioral health approaches, continuing the status quo and lacks accountability in the form of timelines, backup data and metrics. Furthermore, the plan does not represent our recommendations, the spirit and intent of which have been lost. There's a lack of focus on minimizing criminal justice involvement and a lack of a focus on more efforts to address the root causes of incarceration. Next, I ask that the county establish an oversight and accountability entity comprised of ATI work group members and individuals with lived experience of policing and incarceration to support the execution of any plan that's adopted. I appreciate the attempt to include the community. However, I'd like to see continued community engagement rather than a check the box approach with time and resources committed to doing this work and doing it right. Thank you. The next speaker is Xavier Debug. Please accept the unmute. You may begin. Hello, uh, my name is Xavier Espana with Silicon Valley Debug. Um, I would like to thank Supervisors Ellenberg and Chavez for listening to our critique. A um, few members of Silicon Valley Debug were also members of the ATI work group. Um, and we felt like the suggestions and recommendations of the ATI currently were not of real substance. Um, if they were not looking forward to making real policy change, that would be considered real alternatives to incarceration. Um, secondly, I would like to thank Supervisor Lee for his efforts and proposals for re-implementing zero dollar bail to lower the population in Santa Clara County jails and uh, allowing individuals to calendar arrest warrants. Um, being a member of Silicon Valley Debo, we support individuals who have uh, individual cases for themselves or loved ones. And just recently, we had to witness an uh, individual be remanded for an arrest warrant that was issued the night before his court date. So a bench uh, arrest warrant was sent to his home 
mail takes three to five business days. He didn't even have the chance to turn himself in or prepare or let his um, employer know that he would have to get arrested. It was a, it was a surprise to him. And it was completely unfair to the individual who shows up to their court dates every single time. There's no issue. And uh, so once again, we would like to thank Supervisor Lee. Thank you. Thank you. The last speaker, Melissa V. Please accept the unmute. Hello, my name is Melissa and I am from Silicon Valley Debug and also an ATM, ATI work group member and I am also system impacted. I support my family member who's been incarcerated for about over 35 years, spent over two decades in the SHU, had to be on a hunger strike for about 60 days, where towards the end they were splitting seasoning packets from Top Ramen just to stay alive. So um, I do know what it's like. And there are people from Debug who are impacted by incarceration. And I do hope to one day bring him home. And that's why I am on these types of workshops, to bring him home one day. But I also want to thank um, Supervisor Chavez and Ellenberg for um, their support and knowing that this um, implementation plan needs more work. Thank you. That was the last speaker in Zoom. Thank you very much, and thank you to all of the, the speakers who weighed in today. The memo that uh, Supervisor Chavez and I submitted outlines our primary concerns and a motion for this item regarding accountability for the recommendations that were solicited from the community. I'll make the motion in a moment, but I want to first turn to my colleagues for any comments or questions that they may have on the item. I'll second it, but I want to... I didn't, I didn't make it yet. Oh, okay. Yeah, that I was too. So, Supervisor Lee, we're fighting over you. I'll tell my wife about that. <laughs> thank you. No, um, uh, seriously, first of all, I just want to say thank you very much for our <clears throat> staff uh, for this really uh, exciting development on this report. Uh, we have come up with many, many uh, issues that we've uh, highlighted, and you have uh, been able to come up with a report that addresses uh, all of them. Uh, some of the, so, so I want to thank our county administration for all that, and, but also with all the ATI members who participated in the work group for getting uh, us back with this uh, comprehensive report. And I do have a few follow-up questions I want to make. First of all, in the report, Oakland recommends reviewing our current jail population to consider the lessons learned from COVID when we had a much smaller jail population. I understand that the courts have authority over the bail schedule. Um, what has come from the conversations? Because uh, as far as the bail or the zero bail situation is concerned, uh, we were told that the, uh, the courts uh, certainly have a, a very important role to play and that the county executive administration is going to have some conversation. And I would like to ask to see if there's any development on that uh, discussion. Thank you, Supervisor Lee. Um, as, as you mentioned, and first, um, thank you for your gratitude to staff. I wanted to express my own gratitude to uh, county staff who are involved in setting up all of the work and trying to consolidate um, uh, a lot of ongoing work, including significant work directed by the Board of Supervisors to make progress even before the recommendations were released on many of these areas, including many related to behavioral health that come as a result of um, board direction to make really significant investments in behavioral health and housing oriented um, programmatic expansions that as the board knows are, are ongoing that are gonna make, we hope, really significant differences over the long haul in the number of people who can be um, instead provided treatment and housing and that will prevent them from ending up in, in criminal custody. Um, specifically to your question about the zero dollar bail. That's an example of one of um, a number of areas that were topics of discussion um, by the ATI work group and over which the court has pretty exclusive control. I do know that there were, um, and as the board is aware, um, really significant discussions, not only in our um, superior court, but across the state around um, the post COVID um, resuming of a non zero dollar bail scenario. I. Um, I would not uh, speak for the court, but definitely the court is aware of um, 
a diversity of policy perspectives and strong perspectives from many of our ATI workgroup members, county staff, um, around some of the really significant uh, benefits to community that we saw um, when zero dollar bail was in place. But um, again, that's one of those items over which um, county administration doesn't have control and that's the exclusive purview of the court. Yeah, thank you. And, and I just want to mention that um, we've learned that the other jurisdictions is talking about this as well, especially like LA County, for example, about the implementation of the zero uh, dollar uh, zero dollar bail policy. So I certainly want to add um, whatever motion we're going to have uh, follow up to add that potentially if the, if the maker would be willing to listen to 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 continue that discussion with other jurisdiction uh, regarding this uh, issue uh, on revisiting this policy to see how other jurisdictions are we can learn from them. I always like to use that as a way to find out how best uh, what best practices we can have on these uh, policy to improve our way of getting things done. Um, on goal number two, it calls for establishing more coordinated reentry system, which talks about making a new multidisciplinary team to oversee these changes, which is really exciting. Uh, I just have some basic question on, on this, uh, this team um, from staff. Uh, who do you think would be the one making up with this uh, multidisciplinary team? Key, do you want to speak to that? It, um, you know, the one one maybe point of clarification I noticed across some of the questions that were coming in was um, maybe an opportunity to clarify the sort of case management focus of that that work as opposed to the system wide planning type activities. Yes, um, thank you, Supervisor, for that question. Um, first, I'd like to try to provide a little bit of context that we can help uh, illuminate our thinking behind this recommendation. Um, first, um, our departments are doing a tremendous job working with uh, many individuals coming into contact with the jail and who are currently in jail and leaving jail. Um, but as you know, approximately 30,000 individuals are booked into the jail each year. And some, many of those individuals leave the jail within 48 hours. Um, the intent behind this recommendation is for us to identify a team, an organization within the county that is able to more fully assess and determine the reentry needs of all of the individuals that come into contact with the jail. Of, of course, the implementation of that will take some time and will have to be prioritized. We're not going to be able to assist 30,000 individuals at any given time. Um, and the, the focus of this organization or team would be both a systematic ap approach, creating the processes, the communication, the coordination that allow us, that would allow the county to um, achieve that goal of, of assessing everyone. But also it has to be applied to the individual. So once those assessments are done, uh, the, uh, an understanding of the range of interventions that are needed. Uh, we can then, of course, try to expand existing interventions, create new ones uh, that don't exist, uh, and then, of course, apply it uh, to the individuals in coordination with um, other departments uh, that they may be working with them. And if I could just add key, you know, some of the work that's already happening at reentry really is, um, is what we would build upon there. So at reentry, a person who comes for services can use that as a um, point to access behavioral health services, to access county benefits, to um, access housing opportunities, to access a whole range of services provided by different county departments. And so when we say interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary team-based approach, it's really um, having teams of folks with that domain expertise to be able to um, help support people with a whole range of needs, um, each of which are interconnected. So besides county departments, um, experts, let's say, right, uh, are we planning to also include the community leaders with some lived experience in this oversight team as well? Um, we, d we see this as a, a function for county staff or our contractors. The development and of the processes uh, would certainly include the input of, of individuals with lived experience. And, and of course, um, we run programs and services, but a lot of the coordination, the communication um, that has to happen, uh, for example, with formal diversion programs, of course, necessarily involves the district attorney's office, the mm -hmm. courts, and, and the public defender's office. 
Okay. Now, um, in terms of the authority and oversight, um, just try to understand how this will work. Are they going to be able to report to the board, the PSJC, or the reentry network? How is that? How do you foresee this? One thing I was just, um, I, I did want to just differentiate. I think the, the multidisciplinary team, and Key, maybe you can speak to this in a little bit more detail. We're talking about sort of teams of folks who are going to support and case manage individual clients. And of course, there's a much broader leadership effort to help advance um, and coordinate a lot of the work that's happening across systems. And so um, on the reporting components, it will be um, the, the, regular reporting from county administration and staff on all of the areas where we're making programmatic investments um, through, of course, public safety and justice, health and hospital, and other board committees where, um, where we're engaged in ongoing reporting on particular um, bodies of work. And we started to outline that um, in the report back on, on the work group to make sure that where some of the recommendations really speak to program expansions that we already have an ongoing um, uh, uh, area of work where we're reporting to the board regularly. A good example would be the expansions on, on 988, um, the trust program, um, that work, that we would continue to report to the board on those efforts through the existing cadence of reporting that we've already established. Um, but if you had a specific question about um, some of these efforts, I don't want to um, go I'm, a different I'm, I'm, direction. I think, I think this is good, and I'm just, I think that's my last question. I'll let my colleague ask their questions. Thank you. I mean, I'm just going to um, stick with Supervisor uh, Lee's focus on the multidisciplinary reentry uh, planning team just um, quickly now. The, the work that you described, Greta, a lot of which is happening, um, and, and I very much appreciate and appreciate the overall report, but I'm not clear how this team would differ from the current scope and purpose of the Office of Diversion and Reentry Services and the Reentry Network. Key, do you want to? So, so, um, Key, can you just maybe speak a little bit to the differentiation between um, multidisciplinary teams that serve individual clients and really focus on meeting those clients' needs versus our overall? structure for planning and reporting for the reentry work as a whole? Sure, maybe I can start with the, the reentry network. Um, uh, don't, don't mean to speak for the board, but the reentry network uh, advises, make recommendations on the different programs and services that we have begun to develop through our adult, through our adult reentry strategic plan um, and makes recommendations to the board upon, you know, about the effectiveness of those programs and our systems of care. Uh, the, the Office of Diversion and Reentry Services um, um, primarily supports uh, the activities of, through REN and is the, the convener, the, the writer, the collator of our adult reentry strategic plan and our reports. In addition, the, the office um, has been uh, authorized and uh, uh, supported to run specific diversion and reentry efforts, mainly around our reentry center and our employment programs. Um, and we are, um, and they have been tasked periodically with um, special initiatives. For example, um, reentry planning for women coming out of, out of the jail. Uh, that is a good example of uh, of. It, an effort to bring together the different departments, identify the women who are in the jail at different points of this system, and to then develop a process and a method to assess their reentry needs and then implement that over time. I think our, um, our, our intention here is to then build upon that and determine the appropriate uh, organization and structure that is necessary uh, to bring that to scale for uh, everyone in the jail. Thank you. It, would it be correct or close to say that the distinction might be that the team that you're talking about now is focused on individuals and, and the offices and the boards and commissions that exist are focused on systems? Is that a fair distinction? I think that would be fair, yes. 
um, the, the team is called a re-entry planning team, but the, um, the corresponding work group recommendations include ones that relate to alternative destinations and expanding court-based diversions. Would work in these areas also be accomplished by a re-entry planning team? Um, uh, yes. So the planning team would help us identify uh, whether our existing um, uh, formal diversion programs um, have adequate capacity. Uh, so they would be working with the court system and all the justice system partners to try to expand those existing activities. Um, they would also, and, and, and those activities or alternative to incarceration or diversion programs, you know, sometimes consist of just treatment services or case management services, and, and sometimes coupled with you know, physical locations or types of residential treatment programs like a crisis residential treatment. So in, in that sense, the reentry plan uh, team would help expand create new or identify the need for new alternatives for incarceration. Um, and uh, that team would also help, uh, uh, for example, the Office of Pretrial Services identify the needs of individuals who are on um, electronic monitoring, uh, supervised own recognizance, those types of programs as well. And will there be people with lived experience on this multidisciplinary team? Um, I, I think the, the, both the Office of Diversion Reentry Services and Behavioral Health have um, committed to and have made great strides in including individuals with lived experience uh, as staff members. I, I think that would continue, of course. As staff members. So. I, I think maybe one of the distinctions, and maybe you can clarify this, the, the, the multidisciplinary team proposed is an internal county staff team to help us better coordinate the work across these areas. And of course, critical to getting that work right is the feedback and input from many folks with lived experience, partners outside of the county, et cetera. But Key, is that the distinction that you were, were trying to draw, that we're not um, proposing to establish a new body that would be um, duplicative of or similar to, say, reentry network or the, the work group that was brought together for ATI, but really a better way to um, achieve a non-siloed, um, more effective internal planning and communication structure within county administration to really make this work move forward effectively. Thank you. That's, that's the key distinction I was looking for. Uh, let me go uh, down the to Supervisor Simidian, then Arenas. Madam Chair, my light is on only to request that when the time comes, you read out or say out loud the entirety of the motion because my guess is, and I probably shouldn't guess, but my guess is that it's not to um, <clears throat> act on the entire letter but on the bullet points that I've looked at there and I think it will be helpful and important for me as a board member, but also presumably for the record to just be clear about what is and isn't in the motion when the time comes, please. Absolutely, and thank you. Supervisor Arenas. Thank you. I really appreciate your questions, um, President Ellenberg, especially those that have to do with um, who makes up these different groups and if any of them have um, the type of experience that um, I think a lot of our speakers um, insist for us to um, ensure that those voices are heard and integrated into the recommendations, and I absolutely agree with that. Um, and so I, I really appreciate that um, President Ellenberg and Supervisor Chavez have developed this um, memo um, that will help mend or maybe uh, cover those gaps and um, and really create some level of accountability um, that I think uh, is important to have um, that come with metrics and timelines and um, uh, the, the responsible parties. I mean, I think these are just kinds the, the kinds of things that allow us to um, believe that that what is on paper will be followed, um, will be um, kept on track, 
and um, and complete it more comprehensively. And so, I absolutely agree that these are the kinds of things that that need to make sure happen, especially that um, uh, feasibility analysis um, for growth areas. Um, that's a really good segue for my own self around what I was going to talk about next, and that is um, in, in one of the original um, work group recommendations, there was a, um, a recommendation about conducting a pilot with alternative destination site in South County to develop and refine processes and information sharing around alternative destinations. The San Martin substation has been suggested as a potential location. And my, my question is about, uh, and because this was, this was outlined, obviously, you know, I represent the south part of this county. Um, I was hoping to hear from you how we are going to make sure that equity guides the implementation plan. Um, if, if we recognize that South County is really behind in terms of support, um, both, you know, whether it's the city or police department policies, um, but also in the access of our local county services, what, what will we be doing? How will we um, use equity to help further guide the implementation plan? Supervisor, maybe I'll get started on that, and then I would welcome um, any of the staff on the panel to to chime in as well. I think um, really consistent with what you just shared, one of the first and foremost ways that we look at where we should cite expanded services is where is there demand for those services, where do we see gaps in our existing capacity to provide those services, and as you mentioned, we know that um, expanding reentry programming in South County is a really significant priority exactly in that vein. Um, we were very excited to expand what was initially 10 years ago a pilot of the reentry program that's adjacent um, here across the parking lot down into South County and to continue growing um, the set of services that are offered in South County. And I think the um, recommendation that you highlighted is a good example of where um, part of the overall effort to expand and plan around services requires looking at what alternative destinations or expanded reentry programming are most needed in South County, whether of our existing facilities, um, whether it's the, the substation that was mentioned or other county facilities where other services are co-located and may be able to um, offer more one-stop shop opportunities for us to better leverage staff and programming might be the right places to cite those expanded services. Um, so those are exactly the types of issues that um, staff are continuing to um, look at even prior to receiving these recommendations, but really um, to, to, to push hard on to continue expanding in light of the really wonderful feedback, specific and general, that we got through the ATI workgroup process. I really uh, appreciate that, and I think that we, we need to make sure that we connect what we're doing in um, uh, other fields, such as um, our public health department that just finished um, and um, doing the, the study, the, the cost of um, gun violence, right? Um, and there's five zip codes there, one of which is um, in Gilroy. Um, and it isn't lost on me that Carroller is, I think, the only remaining city that doesn't have a safe gun storage. Um, yeah. Um, and, and also the, the, the highest number of aggravated assaults um, per capita. So, you know, I, I think there is, there's a lot, a lot of data that we already have that point to um, um, the level of, of equity that we want to build into this implementation plan and into the systems. Obviously, the people speaking and um, using their voices are, are obviously um, um, a very, for me, the, the, of the highest quality in terms of source of data. Um, and then we have the data that we've collected um, within our own departments and how are we um, ensuring that that data also speaks to us and informs us um, or continues to inform, uh, inform us and that they're not these sets of data um, and studies that are, are separate from all of us. Um, 
and I think, you know, for me, this, this goes back to, I think one of the speakers talked about the root causes of incarceration. And so it, it, while we are improving the systems and making sure that we address the gaps that you just indicated, um, we also need to look at those root causes and, and make sure that, that the data that is speaking to us is, is informing us. And so I'd love to see um, some of that recent um, data. And then, of course, the Latino health assessment, when that um, is finally produced, is somehow integrated into what this, um, what the recommendations end up be, being in the end, or hopefully the, the same implementation plan in the way that I think my colleagues have very thoughtfully um, asked for this to pivot. Um, I, I just would love to see how all of these things together um, uh, really create some strategies um, that are fed to us by data and then provided to us by our community um, and then recognized by the usage of our own internal services. Um, so, so anyways, I, 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 I'm, I will be supporting that, right. that future motion that is going to happen. And I just want to thank my thank colleagues. Thank you. For I'm going to make it if, if that's all right I'm right now because I think we just lost Joe and we're about to lose Otto. Well, um, thank you to both of you. So, so the, the motion, fortunately, is largely on the, on the memo in, in front of all of you, and it was submitted to the record. My motion is to direct administration to respond no later than December 2023 individually to each of the work group's recommendations and strategies, and for the responses to conform to the following standards. Number one, for ongoing or planned activities that are reported as responsive to the recommendations, implementation metrics, timeliness, priority levels, and responsible departments should be defined. Two, where administration finds that a recommendation does not need to be implemented because of, ro uh, because of robust existing work in the area or lack of need for it, metrics that evidence that case should be given. Third, when recommendations are beyond the purview of the county, a body that does have jurisdiction over that uh, recommendation should be noted. And finally, for growth areas, a rating or a brief analysis of feasibility resources, cost, timeline, and responsible departments should be given. And in, in addition to that, um, there, are just, there are two items that I'd like to direct for discussion at a further PSJC meeting, and then we'll look for a second. Um, for all of that. First, I'm interested in digging more substantially into OCLEM's recommendation uh, regarding bail practices, which um, Supervisor Lee brought up, which was also a topic discussed in the work groups. I know our county previously conducted a robust multi-year reform effort with our bail and release work groups, and in 2022, the Public Safety and Justice Committee uh, directed our intergovernmental relations team to conduct advocacy on legislation related to recommendations from the work groups. We haven't heard anything on the status of that advocacy yet, nor the status of the previous work groups recommendations. So I'd like to agendize a discussion in PSJC for January 2024 on those issues and receive an update at that time from County Council, Office of Pretrial Services, and any other relevant departments on the topic. And second, one of the work group members' primary goals for their recommendations has been safe reduction of the jail population. Uh, from our discussions around uh, quarterly reports in PSJC on the jail population, I understand that there are challenges uh, and limitations to jail population reduction through alternatives to incarceration and mental health diversions. But we've, we've really only discussed this uh, briefly and haven't yet received any statistics uh, evidencing potential limits to safe jail population reduction through ATIs and diversions. Uh, the November quarterly ATI and diversions report should include that data. And I see Casey nodding, so those two work for her. The primary motion is here and looking for a second. I'll, I'll second it. Um, and I, I just, I wanna make one comment that I think where we're looking for information I think that's fine. I think where we're looking for things to come back to our committee, that's the right direction. I do just want to acknowledge how incredibly iterative this is and how incredibly complex it is. So I think what we're accepting today, we're receiving a report with some requests for information to come back to us in a, in a specified way so that it's matrix. leveling for everybody in terms of the matrix. 
and that we're looking for um, discussions to come back to committee in the areas that you outlined as the motion. Is that accurate? Yes, thank you. Okay, thank you. Supervisors, um, uh, your lights are on. Are they yes. anybody uh, to speak or to vote? Um, it, it is to speak. And I just want to add um, to the um, uh, to the motion as a friendly amendment, if we could, um, as you read your your motion reflected in your memo, mm -hmm. I'd like for the first bullet to include equity. Um, so for ongoing or, un or planned activities that are reported are responsive, implementation timelines, mm -hmm. priorities, um, um, equity principles, and responsible departments. Got it. Equity um, principles to right. follow priority levels, for sure. Yeah, and then the same thing for the last uh, bullet um, is somehow to integrate equity in, into um, that uh, feasibility analysis. Mm -hmm. um, and then in the third memo, um, the third bullet, I'm hoping that um, we, we're going to note that um, the recommendations that are beyond our purview um, uh, be noted and I think reflected in a letter or uh, maybe even sent to the body that is responsible. Um, as a recommendation from from uh, the work group, if that is, if you are open to the, that, the the additions of equity are fine. the um, The last one, we do talk with all of those groups in PSJC and Reentry Network, so I I know they're aware of it. Rather than saying yes in this quick moment. I would love to think about the sure. appropriateness of the of the letter. I sit on both PSJC and Reentry Network with Supervisor Chavez, and if that's appropriate, glad to do that. A absolutely, and I think it either should come from the committee, or c should come from the board, or should come from the work group themselves, as in their own voice. Excellent, thank you. Let's. I'm just ready. Supervisor, to just to vote. Okay. My yes. light is on. I have a number of questions just to make sure we understand the scope of the referral. And <laughs> just, just but I'm happy. To, oh, I'm sorry. Just I didn't mean really to jump in front of Supervisor no, no, no. Simidian. No, no. Wants us to vote. Oh. Okay. But you want to get clarifications of? Do you need the clarifications prior to the vote, or might we do a cleanup clarification? Well, maybe I'll just ask one very, um, maybe make one broad observation, sure. which is um, the, the, the analysis you requested um, verbally that's not in the written motion that you asked to come back to PSJC, mm -hmm. that in and of itself is an incredibly complex and time-consuming analysis around the jail population. I just want to make sure it's understood that the amount of work associated with that is very significant, and I don't know that the timeline on which it was requested is going to be um, viable. Then let me um, amend that to asking first for an off-agenda report on what that work would look like. Okay, that's, that's fine. Idea. And then my other um, observation is I just want to make sure that um, staff can bring back the work product that you're requesting because for each of the 37 recommendations, I just, um, the board is asking for us to do pretty in-depth analysis and create um, a a chart that will reflect that analysis of feasibility, cost, associated appropriate metrics, timeline, responsible departments. Does not have to all be okay. filled in at once. The, the matrix should exist and, and it should have whatever the basic information is that's available. We're doing, we're already doing this, we're going to do this, we're not doing it, we can't do it. I'm, I'm happy to work through a, what a chart would look like for you, I, but I don't I expect full analysis to be done in a month. May I make yes. a recommendation on that? I, um, I, one recommendation would be that the, the matrix actually come back to public safety and justice, the actual framework for discussion, and that way the next steps are much more clear to staff about expectations. Is that helpful or no? I think it's helpful. I think even, I, you know, the, the challenge is to do in a meaningful quality way, the analysis that's requested requires a, a really significant amount of work that we're happy to do, but for each of the 37 recommendations, and so I just wanted to make sure that we were hearing clearly that the board is wanting us to do that level anal of analysis for each of the recommendations, and if so, we're happy to go forth and, and bring that back. I think an excellent um, exercise for the committee is to go through those and make that determination there. 
in committee. I think we're ready to vote. I do have a question, Madam oh, Chair. please. Thank you. I wanted to ask the maker and the seconder to confirm my understanding that the motion addresses process analysis and metrics only, not suggesting that that's not a significant task, and does not involve any policy recommendations per se. That's accurate. <clears throat> Correct. Thank you very much. Supervisor Arenas. Yes. Supervisor Chavez. Yes. Supervisor Simidian. Vice President Lee. Aye. And President Ellenberg. Yes. Motion passes with five. Thank you very much. And really, thank you to, to all of the, the staff in front of us, Key and Casey and Martha. Who can't I see? And Veronica, sorry. <laughs> thank you all so much. Our next item is, let's see. <laughs> Hold on. Be right with you. 16, 16. which is a uh, Levine Act, uh, requires a Levine Act announcement. Item number 16 is subject to the Levine Act. Any party or their agents must disclose on the record a contribution of more than $250 made to a board member as described on page three of the agenda. Participants who have a financial interest and their agents are requested to make a similar disclosure. Madam Chair, I'll move that this item be continued to our next scheduled meeting. I'm seeing if there's a, a second, if there's a second, we can take a vote. I was just asking if this item could be moved to our next meeting. The uh, board members have to, we've got a couple of board members who have to leave. I know uh, we had lively discussion about this. At Hewlett, thank you again, Madam Chair. Uh, I think you were the one who asked if we could hear it on yes, today's agenda. If we could kick it to the next meeting, that yes. would allow both of us to participate. Uh, absolutely. Thank absolutely. you. I appreciate that courtesy. Second. All right. We can take a vote on that, but I'll also note that you might want to bring sleeping bags to the next meeting because we also have the Stanford uh, community plan and the housing element, but we will do it all. We need a vote. We need a vote. We're going to vote to hold item 16. Supervisor Arenas? Yes. Supervisor Chavez? Yes. Supervisor Smidian? Vice President Lee? Aye. And President Ellenberg? Yes. The motion passes. All right. That leaves us with one item remaining uh, today, which is the fiscal forecast and budget planning for fiscal year 2024-2025. Yes, good afternoon. Hold on one second. I'll um, try to bring up a slide deck real quick. Folks, see that? Okay. I'll just walk through a couple uh, slides based on the um, report that the board has in, in front of it. So as the board is aware, uh, we are facing a pretty changed uh, fiscal picture for the county overall. Um, and what this chart shows uh, is our current best projection, understanding of course that the exact numbers on here will inevitably not be uh, exactly accurate, but I bet the current best projection, and it's based on the fiscal model that was shared with the board uh, at the time of the recommended budget conversation several months ago. Uh, and what this shows is our uh, projected gap between our recovering, recurring revenue and recurring expenditures. In other words, a structural gap that's estimated at this time to be about $280 million for the upcoming fiscal year. Um, shows that that is likely to grow over the next few years. And the, um, the main drivers of this are quite simply that the uh, projected rate of revenue growth, and you'll see in each year there is projected revenue growth, but that the projected rate of revenue growth 
uh, is not keeping pace with expenditure growth. And that's due to a variety of factors, including the inflationary environment, significant slowing of role growth. I actually got um, some um, this month's numbers, or rather last month's numbers from uh, the assessor's office uh, this morning and with the slowing in volume of sales, for example, that significantly affects uh, property tax, rural growth property tax being our largest source of discretionary revenue, um, as well as uh, you know, increased uh, costs um, across the board, everything from utility costs to, of course, uh, more significantly uh, labor costs. Um, the um, structural gap is something that we do have to address. And so what I wanted to talk briefly with the board about is at a high level, the initial steps that we're intending to take in order to bring to the board a balanced budget, which is of course our legal requirement. So we're anticipating and planning at the administration level to deal with a deficit for the upcoming year that is in a range between 180 and 380 million, um, recognizing that we're still very early in the year and so there's wide variability. Regardless of where that may exactly land, those are quite significant numbers and quite a big shift. We, you know, we were very fortunate to enjoy a number of years of robust uh, revenue growth. In order to give departments um, the ability to address some of these challenges in a multi-year fashion, our expectation is that we'd bring forward recommended budget that would address about 75% of the structural gap through structural solutions in this upcoming budget and about 25% with one-time funds. And that'll allow um, some uh, multi-year implementation for some recommendations. This was will roughly translate, and again, we're just talking about general fund here, but this will roughly translate to a five to 8% net general fund reduction. Um, we will um, not be taking an across the board approach in, in what we ask departments uh, to do. We have to recognize, for example, that there's some areas that are heavily general fund reliant, such as uh, our jail, where we have um, mandates, legal mandates and staffing challenges, for instance, uh, that will necessitate um, uh, adjustments as well as the significant work, for example, that the board has directed in areas such as behavioral health. We're also gonna be looking to, for some countywide related options um, and any savings that are identified from those uh, will reduce departmental related targets. We've already started conversations with departments uh, well in advance of any formal instructions um, and uh, asked them to start thinking about these strategies including interdepartmental conversations. You know, we have many systems of care where multiple departments touch the same clients uh, and there may be opportunities to look holistically at how those services are provided. We also recognize, including lessons learned from prior areas of reductions, even though it's been a while for us as a county, we've been through this before. Uh, so it's not a, a, a panic, it's gonna be very real. It's something that we have to grapple with. Uh, but the county organization has uh, been through this before. Uh, and we have some lessons learned. And one of those is that it's important to continue to make investments in certain things like facility maintenance and core IT infrastructure that the last round of, of a decade or so of reductions, um, in some cases, even to this day, uh, we're dealing with some of the consequences of um, those deferrals. In addition, uh, we'll be asking departments to ensure that looking at advancing equity in service delivery is a critical focus to their proposals that they're thinking carefully about that in any reduction recommendations that are brought forward and of course in what administration ultimately presents as a recommendation to the board. We have asked departments to think about some important questions um, as we embark on this, what is quite significant body of work. Uh, one is to identify revenue opportunities, and that, of course, includes maximization of our federal and state resources and grants. Um, you know, that's a challenge a little bit in the current fiscal environment. Uh, some of you may be aware, for example, the House of Representatives just for the first time in its history uh, passed a motion to vacate, and so there's no Speaker of the House right now. Um, 
And so, you know, at the federal level, I, I don't think there's an expectation of new revenue sources, but, um, but still whatever opportunities can be identified to maximize drawdowns there, as well as um, from state resources, grants, and other sources. We've asked departments to pivot towards using the general fund as a funding source of last resort. In the last decade of robust general fund growth, that wasn't something that needed to be at the front of mind for folks. Um, and uh, we need to, as an organization, be much more cognizant of utilizing general purpose revenue as a last resort to fill critical gaps rather than as the first place to look. We'll be asking folks to assess current programs and functions to see if there's things that can be sunset and pivot those resources elsewhere to determine whether there are opportunities for consolidation, especially where we have multiple uh, functions in different parts of the organization. And um, whether there are things that we are currently paying outside entities to do, such as consultant resources, that can potentially be done either by the, that department internally or um, done by a different county department where there may be an opportunity for one department to functionally acquire another department's services in order to uh, not only get good quality work product, but be able to help support and sustain uh, that department's operations with those staff. In order to ensure that we're in a position to be able to bring forward uh, a range of robust options and also ensure that um, we're in a position uh, to proceed without layoffs. And this is important. I mentioned in the county executive's report, you know, we had 1,300 folks show up at a job fair. Uh, we want our staff to have comfort in knowing that uh, we're in a position that there won't be um, layoffs if folks are being hired, especially in critical positions. Um, but in order to create that space and in order to create options for departments, uh, we will need to do what I'm calling a soft hiring freeze. There'll be continued strategic hiring in, in areas, but we need to look at the overall vacancy rate in a department as well as vacancy rates for specific classifications so that we have confidence that departments have the ability to actually um, offer up uh, and be able to meet budget targets. Um, and so there will need to be, in some cases, uh, um, positions that are frozen in order to create that space. Uh, in addition to that, something, again, that's a little different, uh, the hiring freeze component is something this organization has done several times in the past, but consistent with my comment earlier about asking departments to ask if there are um, resources that they can acquire, so to speak, from other parts of the organization. We'll be having a secondary review process for consultant hiring so that there's another set of eyes on that. Now, of course, there are areas where um, we do need to continue to use those external um, uh, consultants. In some cases, it's even necessary, um, but uh, legally or otherwise, or for particular expertise, but having a secondary review process will bring a countywide lens to that. Uh, and as I said, this will create space for departments to actually be able to offer uh, recommendations for us to deal with the structural deficit. So that's my brief presentation. I'm happy to answer questions from the board. This is the beginning of a conversation. Obviously, you know, we've got uh, many, many touch points throughout the process. We will have um, increasing certainty and in information as we progress through the fiscal year. Uh, one of the things I'm keeping a particularly close eye on is uh, role growth, because like I said, that is our largest source of uh, discretionary revenue. We're also paying close attention to um, other issues related to property tax, such as the calculation of excess ERAF, which is an issue I know the board is well aware of, we're very concerned about, um, and that has a significant impact on revenue. So. You know, these are all um, very critical, important pieces. Um, and uh, I'll pause there and happy to answer questions. Thank you. Anshanae, do we have um, public speakers on this item? 
We do not have any cards for chambers and no speakers in Zoom. All right. Um, thank you, James, for, for providing the report. I very much appreciate that we're going to have this conversation now, or at least the first of several conversations now, and not wait until January uh, and February. Uh, and, and I understand that mid-year will be the best time to dive into more detail, but I want to be sure that we're using the time between now and then to ensure that the board will have complete, well-organized, actionable information to inform those decisions. Uh, your report noted a few specific initiatives, including assessing county fees, um, an RFP for the, the health plan, and other opportunities for cost savings in uh, procurement efforts. Uh, what I would like to see, and this is um, quite a, a regular trope for me, is a matrix. I, I think very visually in, in charts, but um, a matrix of, of any major initiatives that could result in significant expense reductions or revenue increases, um, if possible, along with an estimate of the potential net uh, impact. Um, I'm also eagerly watching the um, assessor's office for, for any updated projects there. Uh, what I would like is um, to make a motion to receive the report with a request that as part of the mid-year budget discussions administration uh, prepare a matrix for the board that summarizes any potential initiatives that would have a significant impact on expenses and revenues, um, including an estimate of net uh, fiscal impact of each. And what would be helpful is along the way so that we can iterate if that form could first be presented to FGOC in December. That gives us some time to uh, iterate it and be sure that it's really a useful tool that board and administration can use uh, collaboratively, both for mid-year and then going into 24-25. I think Before we can I turn for it. Thank you. I think we can certainly do that. And um, just for clarification, I think we're, we're talking here about uh, general fund. Yes. Yep. I always want to know where the other money is coming from, too. But since general fund is uh, is is volatile and in the place where we have some discretion, that's that is the um, the focus. I'll, I'll leave it at that right now. Uh, Supervisor Lee then Arenas. No, I don't want any further comments. Ready to vote? Oh. <laughs> Whoa. Okay. Supervisor Arenas. Oh, thank you. Um, so I want th thank you for the presentation, even though I it's all terrible, terrible news. <laughs> Not what we want to hear, especially when um, a lot of our community is hurting and in need. And uh, typically, what our government does is they spend more, especially our arm of the government that is supposed to be the safety net, is a safety net for our community, right? And we saw that during the pandemic, we are the safety net, like the federal government is not. And so um, it makes me really <laughs> nervous that we are seeing a lot of really difficult years ahead of us. Um, and so I would like to see this, um, what, what, whatever direction we go in as collectively as a group, we know that we're going to be making some really difficult decisions. Um, I'd like to see in those decisions um, there be an opportunity for us to, to do more program budgeting. We, we are being asked um, to take a look at, at I think one, of the, one of the things that you have in your um, ledge file is, the county will need to reassess programs and policy initiatives in order to ensure that we are able to deliver those services that are mandated by law focused on the county's mission and highest priority needs and responsive to the current and emerging needs of the community. And the one thing that strikes me as odd is that we don't have a program budget. And uh, having a uh, that type of a, of a budget, I think, allows for us to make these kinds of decisions. Otherwise, I, I don't know how we would be able to do that as a board. I'd like to see what the value is in each of the programs, what the cost is, um, and what 
and what the benefits are for, for our community. Because part of that strategy is, um, is to take what is most effective and useful and supportive to our community. Um, and I'm really nervous that I think in your memo is it, it already um, illustrates that, that the departments are already moving towards some reductions or some strategies, but I don't know why you, they would move to some strategies um, in terms of reductions because we haven't decided what kind of direction we're going to take. And so the kind of movement that needs to happen for me is, is for us to have a conversation collectively as a board um, to figure out what did we learn in past um, recessions or di really difficult uh, fiscal periods? What are some of those um, lessons learned that we don't want to repeat again? Um, I know that we, uh, as, as a council member, had to undo some of the um, inadvertent um, repercussions of a prior council. Um, and I'll give you a really solid example. The, the city of San Jose has about 51 community centers throughout, throughout its, its boundaries, um, yet they only um, run 11, 11 of those community centers. And the rest of them were shut down. Um, but there was the reason, the, the reason obviously was the last recession. Um, and so they only kept the ones that, um, that were most viable. And of course, the, the ones that were most viable and had, uh, we're going to generate revenue or in places where people can actually spend that money. Um, and so that meant that uh, many of our, our communities that actually needed those services didn't have them accessible to them during a very difficult time. And so that was, uh, that was a decision that was made um, in a, in a more um, equal way and not equitable. Mm -hmm. um, and that was a, a really difficult lesson that our communities continue to uh, feel the repercussions of. And so one of the things that, that I, we had to do, and I'm um, very proud to, to have led this, is to ensure that there were scholarships for some of the areas of our community centers where we had to cancel classes because people just couldn't afford them. Um, I want us to avoid some of those same kinds of decisions, especially because we are the safety net. And when we decide to reduce programs, we're reducing support systems for our families that really rely um, on us. And so I think the only way that I would be able and would be comfortable doing this is if we had a program level budget where we see what those programs cost, what they actually produce, um, and what are those, uh, what are those um, measurable outcomes. Um, I don't know that I could do, do that at this point. And so I'd love to hear what my, my colleagues think about this. I, I know that it is, um, going to be something really different and probably um, a, a huge workload. But being that we are going to be in these difficult fiscal, financially, um, uh, years until 2028, I think we need to invest in a way that makes sense um, when we are making these kinds of very difficult decisions. Um, so I, I'll, I'll leave it at that. I do have a couple of more um, I have a couple of more comments and, and questions, but I'd love, just for the interest of, of conversation, I'll leave it at that, and then I'll jump back in later. You want to go sure. first, and then Supervisor So you're, you're absolutely correct, Supervisor. We don't have a program-based budget. We have an incremental base budget um, system that's, that the county utilizes. Um, and, you know, there's, pros and cons to the to different approaches to budgeting, zero-based budgeting, modified zero-based budgeting, program-based budgeting, and incremental budgeting. Um, the, um, the, to shift from, away from incremental-based budgeting to program-based budgeting is a very significant 
effort that would necessarily take multiple fiscal years. The good news is we're in a process to uh, acquire a different budget system. Uh, and so that's something that can be looked at as part of that um, project process and timeline. Uh, but we do have a, a, an entire budget infrastructure in the organization that's currently built on incremental based budgeting, which is the model most commonly used uh, by local governments, including counties in California, but not exclusively. And there are a couple that, that have different models, including um, certain modified program based budgeting models. So that's something that we are starting to have conversations around because we heard the comments in June uh, around that. But that is a that is a big initiative and necessarily um, is, is a conversation that has to operate on a slightly separate track from, from the fiscal year budget process given um, the implications associated with, with that change in infrastructure, especially for an organization of the size and scope of the county with the different types of funding streams and structures in place. Uh, but I, there's a lot of, um, um, there are advantages associated to it, which is that you can see activity at a programmatic level in a way that you just can't in the current budget structure that we have at the county, you just can't. And, uh, and so I think that's a very valid concern. Uh, but I did wanna just be clear about what the implications of what that functionally means for, for the organization. Um, you know, the, the other comments that, that you, you raised, um, you know, th this is um, a big, I would just say kind of stepping back a couple steps. Um, there's a lot of lessons learned from the prior years of reductions. There's been a lot of staff turnover. It's been many years for our organization. I entered the county at the very tail end of those, uh, those times. Um, but a, for a lot of our uh, organizational leaders. Uh, they certainly weren't in the roles that they're in, uh, may not have been, at, many of them weren't at the county at all. Um, and so, you know, that's part of why we've started early conversations with departments uh, and asked specifically that departments try to uh, identify those sources of some historical knowledge around that, because there are some examples. I mean, I can think of some very specific ones like cancellation of academies at county communications for several fiscal years in a row that uh, has led to challenges that we still deal with today, right? Um, and so it is important to try to take those lessons learned as much as possible. Uh, and I did also wanna just say something about your comment about us being the safety net provider. I mean, I think that we recognize that, um, you know, all of us up here recognize that the vast majority of what the county does and certainly how we spend our general purpose revenue is on core safety net services for the most vulnerable in our community. Uh, what is potentially challenging here is we're not in an environment um, where we're likely to see significant augmentations at the state and federal level, um, even where we operationalize and effectuate the service delivery, um, the, given the kind of broader macro political environment, uh, that leaves us a little bit on our own. And unlike the federal government, of course, in a position where uh, we have very limited revenue options. We don't have zero though. Mm -hmm. And so I wanted to also assure the board that at an administration level, we're absolutely looking at exploring each of those very limited, uh, but each of those revenue related opportunities that we may have so that those are options that are brought in front of the board as well. Um, Again, I don't want anybody to misunderstand. They're limited, and they're limited because of primarily decisions made by voters in the state to put provisions in the state constitution that have tied a lot of hands of local governments, and that has really challenging ramifications for an organization like the county, which is a critical safety net service provider. Um, and uh, I'll just speak personally, it's my hope that some of those things will continue to be revisited. Um, I, I would hope that, you know, with, for example, the um, March 
initiative that the legislature has placed on for geo bonds. That's not operating revenue, but that's an example of something that could be movement in a positive direction. But there's also risks on the horizon. And you know something we haven't talked about at the board level, but there's an initiative that's qualified for the ballot in November of 24 that would be devastating to local governments, uh, not only in the sense of making it challenging with respect to um, any tax revenues, but the way it redefines fees, and this is a business roundtable measure that's already qualified for the ballot for November of 24, uh, way it redefines fees that would be crippling to governments across California. So those are challenges and opportunities, some in each category, that are not, of course, reflected in these budget projections. In some cases, will happen well after the board has to legally adopt a budget, but that need to be part of uh, the public awareness and part of the broader conversations because um, we have to do what we can to uh, shape that macro environment given how important the services we provide the community are and the reality that just as the, we heard earlier today with respect to um, the referral regarding the Veteran Services Office, there are many, many areas where uh, the demand outstrips the available resource. Uh, many critical areas, uh, continued need for access to services, healthcare, behavioral health, other things. Um, and, you know, we will um, bring forward recommendations that are very cognizant of those things, but at the end of the day, um, the, the math has to add up and that puts us all in a very tough situation. Supervisor Arenas, do you want to respond and then Supervisor um, Chavez? Yes, just uh, just one comment about that. And I, I, I would like for us to move in this direction because I think part of, part of what I um, have observed, and I've only been here for 10 months, but part of what I've observed um, is that there is a need, at least I'll speak just for myself, to, to really grasp at a programmatic level, what it is that we're doing, what are those costs that are associate, associated with, with some of the best practices, what are some of those best practices. We get glimpses of that through these presentations, but we don't, um, I think, understand at a, at a level where now we have to be uh, surgically precise to carve out um, what we think will be inefficient or can be set aside um, in order for us to, to, to stay afloat, right? Um, and so I think at this point, this is, this is why I think pro programmatic budgeting is important mm -hmm. um, because we will be making those level of decisions and then how do we ensure that any savings that we have and set aside are um, spent on programs and services that um, have equity in mind um, and to ensure that, and to make sure that that happens, we need to be very familiar with the kinds of programs and services that are effective and strategic and best practices. So it just, it's all in one circle. So I, I appreciate that. Um, and um, I'll, I'll leave my comments for, for a later time, but um, thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Chavez. So um, first I wanted to say how much I appreciate that we're doing this now and not in May. So great, and I wanna, I wanna thank our president and our, our new ex exec team for moving us into the present. So thank you for that. Um, second, I, I do wanna just uh, concur with, with my colleague about being very genuinely curious about what the appropriate budget method is for, for an institution our size that really does allow us to have the highest level of um, transparency in terms of how we're spending public dollars. I think that's a great point. And, and when I got here, I wanted it to be zero-based. I think I argued with Jeff for nine years. Um, and, but I, I think one of, the, one of the requests I would make, recognizing that this will be a multi-year approach, I'd be really interested um, in understanding either in the mid-year or the next budget um, 
what you are going to recommend as a budget methodology and and giving the board options of what the implications are for something for an institution this size to be looking at programmatic budgets or zero base budgets or if there's a um, a compelling reason to continue with incremental budgeting what is that and then irrespective of all of that how do we get how is it transparent enough that the public can digest it and frankly all of us can so that would be part of my request as this action goes forward um, second is that I have been pressing for a while for us to do a for, for the board to receive a very um, healthy approach to the to look at the healthcare systems business plan because I think one of the things we can't ignore is how much resources are going into our healthcare system and what are the opportunities for us to um, do a better job of recovering um, payments on whether it's insurance. I think better understanding how the healthcare system needs to be structured in order to, to um, be opportunistic about revenues and options that, that may be more afforded to us if we're structured in a different way. I, I think of all of the things we're going to talk about for the June budget, to me that is by far the most important. We know as a board and from our a community perspective, we are absolutely committed to making sure we have the healthiest, most robust healthcare system anywhere. And at the same time, that that business, like the strategic business decisions that we're making are really important, I think, for the, the, um, the board here to understand, and frankly, I think the public as well. And I know it's, it's presumably an enterprise fund, but it's unclear to me uh, how, our, how the relationship between all of our budgets needs to be more refined in order to both take advantage of the, the opportunities with the healthcare system and then be able to um, to contribute to it. And I don't even like the word subsidy because we should pay for the hospital, so that's not my issue. My issue really is what should our overall goal be in terms of finances and the percentage, frankly, of the general fund that we're contributing to that relative to all the other services that we're discussing. Yeah, I, I very much agree that the, the health system is um, absolutely critical piece of the conversation. And, you know, there's a number of, of elements of work that are underway, some of which have been shared and presented at HHC, but including the efforts around things like Medi-Cal redetermination, around business, you know, the, the, the revenue cycle, uh, and efforts there around the supplemental payments and some of the unique public uh, hospital streams. Uh, by the way, one item that's concerning uh, to us is uh, there's a proposed extension of the MCO tax to make it permanent, mm -hmm. but it would also permanently cap the public hospital share at $150 million statewide in perpetuity, which is deeply concerning because obviously as each passing year goes by over a life of a permanent tax, that $150 million cap becomes... Um, um, diminished, of course, by inflation. So, you know, so there's a number of different pieces. Um, and, um, you know, the operations drive the finances in the hospital system. One of the pieces that is, you know, I, I wholeheartedly agree with your comment about subsidy because one of the things that's not been visible and that we are working, although it will take some time to try to make more visible, is just how much, um, general fund related activity we ask of the hospital system and have the hospital system perform, right? We don't expect or want our county public hospital system to operate as a private sector hospital. If it did, it would only perform procedures that had a positive profit margin. Um, and we of course exist as a safety net service provider and provide a whole range of things that others don't because it's what this community needs. And let me just say, the, um, the reason I think the business plan and the understanding of what that is should actually come as a discrete item to the full board. It is such a big part of our general fund and having the board understand the risks, the opportunities. Susan plays um, an important role on CSAC 
And, you know, and all of us, you know, whether that's, I know we've had offers from our unions to help mm -hmm. us with MCO. I just think that to me, this is so, it's such an imperative to pull out because it's just so big that I think when it gets blended in, it's, it's a little confusing. And I think the point you raise about what we want the hospital to be, even relative to behavioral health and public health, all of that is, is really, those are important um, operational decisions. And in a way, we've sort of floated into them versus distinctly saying, we want to be able to do this, we want to be able to do this, we want to be able to do this. And I have to say, like during COVID, my, my framework of reference about what the, what the health and hospital system is capable of doing really changed because what I understood is that they had the capacity really to lift up public health and behavioral health. They did some amazing things. But again, I feel like we backed into that a bit. And I am really glad that we have both Joe and Otto um, playing a leadership role at committee. And I think having the most significant touch points coming before the full board prior to the final budget in June, I think is just critical. So I would be a request when the, when the motion gets made. Um, I just had three, uh, one other kind of series of recommendations that I wanted to make. One is that I think we need to pull out what we anticipate um, the FEMA paybacks, especially given that they're all one time, James, and I, I know we don't want to even pretend those are ongoing, but understanding year over year what we anticipate the FEMA repayment to look like or if we're done with that, and then what's our loss? Because again, I think we want to be public about here are the investments we made, here, here's what we had to leave on the table. I think we did the right thing, but I think we should be able to talk about that. I'm very interested in understanding over the next 5, 10, 15 years how the bond repayments of the redevelopment um, projects will impact our funding and perhaps our partners' funding if we have a sense of what that looks like. I, I am very interested, and I really want to lift up the point you raised about um, you know, a potential ballot measure that really negatively impacts fee um, structures. And I think we should anticipate, if it's not that ballot measure, we're gonna have a challenge, if essentially, at some point in time. And so the fee management um, approach that you see taking that would really allow us to uh, dive deeper into how, you know, what we consider, um, fee recovery elements I think is important and I mostly share that um, colleagues because I think institutions all are looking at that fee recovery very differently maybe not very differently but there are probably some lessons we could learn from some partners and I just want to really highlight under that category fees I think your point about the impact of ERAF again the board needs to see that in the context of what could be missing again over the next uh, five years and then lastly um, the point you raised about the MCO tax, like I, I have to say that only got on my radar um, recently and not, and frankly not from our institution, but external partners saying, hey, what are you doing about this? And so I, I know there are probably other threats that I'm unaware of, but I think the board should be aware of them um, at your earliest opportunity to make those things possible. But I'm very excited, frankly, about the early conversation really appreciate the diligence around this and really bringing the board along. Um, I, and is there a motion already on the floor? Yes, there's a motion uh, by me, uh, Supervisor Arana seconded it, and I'm delighted to include what I, what I think I heard. Um, Budget method, recommendations, yeah. um, a, a better understanding of the business plan for our health and hospital system that's brought to, you know, separately from just committee to the full board that includes whatever new business models we're gonna be using, and that we get a report out on um, the one-time money from FEMA or other repayments in that arena, that we understand the bond, as bonds are being paid off as part of redevelopment, what that could lead for our budget, the fee management um, strategies that we wanna use, and then just a reminder about ERAF, MCO, and any other threats that James and the team see, because I think they're very real. Thank you. I, I'm, I'm glad to incorporate all of that. And I'm thinking as we move closer to budget next spring that maybe we ought to have an, 
an independent workshop just on the hospital system. I think I see two vigorous nods. Um, and, and I think we had sort of a failed attempt at seeing a business plan, it wasn't really a business plan, um, a while ago. But um, I think that there's, well, there's clearly majority interest, unanimous interest of those who are here um, to add a workshop day that would focus specifically on um, the hospital system, including the pieces that Supervisor Chavez raised. Does that Yeah, I think that'd work? be great. I mean, it, it, I think it would be very helpful, in fact, yeah. if we could actually have some real focused time and attention to talk about some of those revenue streams, especially because so many of them um, are, are heavily affected by the state right. and federal government and, you know, having broader awareness and engagement on some of those issues I think would be beneficial for us in terms of um, um, supporting advocacy in that space. So ideally, because everyone's schedules are so impacted, if we could do those workshops in the context of board meetings in the mm -hmm. spring, that's ideal. If, depending on what is on each each board meeting, if we need to do a standalone a workshop for one or both of those, I would support that. And we can look at that when the the calendar, uh, the board meeting calendar for 24 comes out. So. It has been approved by my office. I believe it's with my colleagues right now. Great. So hopefully that will get to you very soon. We did try to, to do it quite early. Thank you. Um, so thank you for that, Supervisor uh, Chavez. And um, Supervisor Rennes, to, to thank you for your comments as well. Two uh, really stood out to me. One is that the notion of making cuts, you know, certainly if we're asking all departments to do the same thing, she's right, that is the definition of equality over, over equity. I know that you are um, not treating every single department in the same way and, and our higher needs are being recognized. But as things are presented to us, I, I, I believe that we really need to be explicit about the, the, basic, the, the equitable strategy that we are using to reduce something more than, more than another. And the, the second comment that, that you made that really struck me was that in general, with regard to any potential reductions, we, they need to be done in the context of board priorities. So being aware, we have set board priorities for this year. We haven't really done so for the next year. But any kind of departmental decisions should be consistent with <coughs> the board's major priorities. I know you're not going to turn around and take away 50% of behavioral health. But as an example, you know that that is a board priority and, um, and funding decisions should be made with those in mind. We, we do. I, I will say, you know, we have... Um what we currently have by way of the, the direction from the board on those priorities that was discussed in the spring. And we would, of course, take whatever direction from the board on that. Uh, that's something that we'd look to the board to provide. Um, but that's what we're operating from as of now, and that's what's been shared with the organization. Excellent. And, and I think until we have something else, those should not expire. So thank you. Thank you for that. Um, anything else? From my colleagues, yeah, Supervisor Arenas. I, um, because we're, we're going to include um, our employees and other stakeholders, uh, but this is primarily for our employees, I really thought, you know, we're going to ask them um, to make cuts. Um, and usually nobody wants to make cuts um, in their own program, they'll, they'll look to something else or, you know, those guys over there in that other program. Um, and so it, in order for, for that feedback to really be meaningful um, and to also be compensated because people take a risk when they step out and say, hey, there's some inefficiencies in this system and I like to point them out. Um, I'd love to see how we can compensate employees for that. 
Um, and I know that it seems like an oxymoron. <laughs> We're going to compensate them for, for, for um, decreasing the budget here. But, um, but I think spending a little bit, um, whether it's, and I don't mean, it doesn't necessarily have to be in money, but it could be in a, in a very a prestigious parking space close to the county building. <laughs> especially now that the rain season is coming or, you know, some kind of, of benefit to them uh, that they're going to be able to enjoy because of their input that they provided. We'll, we'll give some thought to some ideas around that. Um, yeah, I, I, I did want to just make one comment, uh, Supervisor Ellenberg, to, you, to one of your, your earlier points. Um, you, know, one of the, you know, we talk about departments, but of course departments have multiple funding streams, and some of them are federal grants, and some of them are non-general fund, and some of them are other things. And so we're talking here about general fund, and then within general fund, you know, we have certain functions and things that are mandatory. I'll give you just one small example. We have a maintenance of effort obligation imposed on us by the state for the courts of $40.3 million in this year's budget. That's from our discretionary revenue, but that's statutorily mandated, and that grows every year. Um, so, you know, when we're looking at what we're actually talking about here is we're ta asking departments to look at um, the, the general purpose revenue that they get. And for some departments, they're a wholly different place, right? Um, we're, look we're asking them to look at their general purpose revenue and come up with proposals there. And so that looks different across the organization. And so I just wanted to uh, name that too, so that wasn't lost in this conversation, especially for, I know the departments that are probably tuning in to the discussion. Um, it, it necessarily means that that itself looks very different across the organization. And I'll give you an example. You know, over 35% of our discretionary revenue is used to support public safety justice departments, many of which perform certain mandated functions, obviously, one of the biggest ones being our uh, or jail, for instance, um, um, but that's where discretion, a lot of discretionary revenue goes. And so, even as the hospital system, I agree, is is a very important conversation. I just wanted to name that too because uh, what a general fund uh, uh, ongoing challenge looks like looks very different for different departments because of how they're funded. So. So I think the, the comment that's applied to counties works well for departments. If you've seen one department, you've seen one department. <laughs> and um, the, with regard to the MOE with the courts, quickly, was Senator Cortesi working on something to shift that back to the state? I'm not aware of anything related to the MOE. I know that there was some, some success this year. Re yeah. Oh. yeah, but there was some <laughs> success about. this year with... Um, uh, helping our court um, deal with debt service associated with the family courthouse. Right. That, oh, that's what I yeah, was thinking. But of. the the county MOE and one of the challenges with the MOE, I'll just say, is it penalizes counties like ours that historically uh, generously funded courts when yep. they were a county department, yep. and then have lock, has locked us into a significant maintenance of effort. But that doesn't necessarily translate into more money for our court because the state, of course, has implemented a statewide funding right. formula. So it's really inuring to the benefit of the state, like many, many, many other things, so. We have our third supervisor standing up and having one foot out the door, so I think we should vote on this item, please. And thank you both. Supervisor Arenas? Yes. Supervisor Chavez? Yes. Supervisor Simonian is excused. Uh, Vice President Lee is excused. Uh, President Ellenberg? Yes. Motion passes with three. All right, thank you very much. We are adjourned. Mm -hmm. Gave it an extra beat. We are.